Uh, guys, I'll start the introduction in probably one, one and a half minutes from, from now. All right then, so we have 25 participants. Um, good afternoon and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we are here to talk about a very sensitive topic uh, from two perspectives. One would be from a Kashmiri, the other would be from someone who has done his research enough on uh, how exactly um, that step was illegal. Um, I'm talking about Kashmir, which is uh, offensive for some, emotional for some. We all relate to it with really different contexts. But uh, when I talk about Kashmir uh, as a Kashmiri, uh, when I think of the atrocities of probably just, just one year before, um, I have literally tales to tell you. Uh, but today it's not going to be about me speaking. Uh, it's going to be our two um, wonderful speakers. One is Muzamil Ayub Thakur. Uh, welcome, Muzamil. Uh, Muzamil is going to talk about uh, Kashmir, uh, its history. How do we connect to the history, and uh, what a, what 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 impact did we actually have due to the atrocities there and the abrogation, definitely. The other speaker is Dr. Manish Madan. Uh, welcome, Manish. Uh, Manish is going to connect to the audience who actually look at Kashmir pro from an outsider's perspective, but also uh, understanding the illegal approach the government had on it a year ago. Um, I'm looking forward to both the, both the speakers talking about it. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, Muzamil will have 30 to uh, 45 minutes of the, of the session. Then we can follow uh, that with uh, a question answer session for it. Similarly for Manish. Um, and in case you do not want to speak up in terms of you know, asking the questions, you can probably write it in the chat and uh, we will try to address that. Over to you, Muzamil. Thank you very much for uh, hosting me as well as Manish. Um, thank you to the organizers and of course to yourself to uh, that is moderating this. Now, uh, 35 to 45 minutes is I think probably the first time I've ever been given that long to speak at a stretch, um, uh, which is unfortunate for you because I'm probably gonna still fall short. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting subject and it's a very long-winded subject um, and I know that um, I have to start from history but the problem is uh, when we start most people assume that our history or at least the Kashmir history starts from 1947 after the partition of India um, but the problem is that we the, the struggle for right to self-determination or the struggle for freedom uh, freedom of course azadi as we call it you know it evolves over time um, and Kashmir started well, I can't even tell you that it started in 1931 either, uh, when the Quit Kashmir movement started. I mean, it goes back to, to I mean, I, I, I could even say centuries. My father, my late father, used to say that uh, Kashmir has, for most of its history, has always remained in some form of slavery in one way or the other. And there have been very small dots uh, where we've had some kind of benefit. Um, now, if you really want me to go back into centuries, I will. However, uh, in the interest of time, um, um, 
I will I will jump back and forth a little bit. Um, now, although I did mention that you know there was a quick Kashmir movement, we have to still recognize the fact that the British Empire uh, was around at that time, even before 1931, and Kashmir was sold um, to the Maharaja then in 1846. Um, but that said, even if we leave that aside, and, or, or the fact that Kashmiris were sold um, for what was it, seven seven lakh rupees, or equivalent to you know a few a few hundred uh, cattle. The, the, the issue where we would say the, the crux of the Kashmir issue starts with, um, practically speaking, is the partition. So when India and Pakistan separated and they went their own uh, loving ways, um, Kashmir was a majority Muslim state led by a Hindu ruler. Um, and according, I mean, this is factual. I mean, uh, half the things won't be my opinion, half of them will be based on facts and literature and history. So as a Muslim majority state, the state of Jammu and Kashmir was supposed to be the princely state, mind you, princely. So it was never directly under part of the Raj. Uh, so the princely state was supposed to legally at that time go with Pakistan only because the population was Muslim. Um, India, of course, uh, didn't agree. They said that the Maharaja wants to uh, take the state into the Indian dominion. Um, the Pakistani argument was, well, then Hyderabad, which has a uh, majority Hindu population with a Muslim ruler, should then naturally go to Pakistan. Of course, in, these are arguments between nations, and in the middle are the Muslim Kashmiris. Um, nobody really asked us what we wanted. Now, even when the Maharaja signed the instrument of accession, which is very, you know, highly contested, uh, so Victoria Schofield, Alistair Lamb, Lord Avebury, these people are scholars in their own right who have disputed the uh, timing as well as the uh, authenticity of the instrument of accession. So we consider as Kashmiris, we consider the 27th of October 1947 as a black day or as a dark day in Kashmiri history, uh, because that is when the Indian forces landed in Kashmir to occupy the territory. Now, the argument from the Indian side will be that it was temporary in measure because there were uh, the, the argument from the Indian side is specifically that Pakistani sent its forces. Now, again, factually, historically, academically, uh, this is post-World War II. Let's remember this. The army were tribals. These tribals were had just come back from World War II. They were based in, in Azad, what we call Azad Kashmir, on the Pakistani side of Kashmir. And they were battle-hardened, just come back from war, itching to do something. Um, so they wanted to go and liberate part of their land, or the entire of their land. And that is the reason why the Indian forces came in. And then, obviously, over time, India blamed Pakistan. So then what happens? Pakistan and India have a war. Kashmir is essentially split into two, three if you include the Chinese part, but at that time it was split into two. Uh, Pakistan, according to the UN resolution, stated that uh, Kashmir should be a part of Pakistan. India said exactly the same thing, but we also need to remember it was India that took the issue of Kashmir to the United Nations. It wasn't Pakistan. Um, so, you know, morally, legally, ethically, uh, there are so many different tangents that we can speak on, and that's the problem that every single person will have a different perspective. So from a Muslim perspective, they will have a completely different perspective. From a, a nationalist perspective, they will have a different claim. Um, uh, the, the Kashmiri Sikhs will have a different claim. The Kashmiri Pandits will have a different claim. And that is where the issue lies at this point in time, 73 years on, that's where we are having a problem. But if we fast, fast forward a little bit from 1947, what happened, 1948, what we call the, uh, the Jammu Massacre, which was essentially a genocide, where I think it was the, uh, a Lon the London Times, a British newspaper, um, wrote that a quarter of a million people were killed in October, in October and November. They say, some people say it was a matter of 48 hours, some people say it was over a week, but a quarter of a million people were killed. And before that, I mean, I keep on jumping back and forth, but before that, 1931, there were more than 20 people uh, that were trying to uh, do the call of prayer on a Friday uh, that were killed one by one and that call of prayer never ended and we we celebrate not celebrate but we commemorate that day as well as a dark day in our history so there has always been some form of oppression and occupation and subjugation on the people of Kashmir be it by the current Indian government or be it historically by the Dogras by the Mughals by the uh, Afghan empire or the Khalistan empire 
um, or rather the seeker by whatever you want to call it, there's always been something. And at one point in time, you know, it, it's in our genetics. My father used to say this, in our, it's in our DNA that we have experienced slavery. And when we are born, we know what that means. And because we know what that means, we always aspire for more, especially in this day and age when we know what freedom means. For those of us that are living outside of the subcontinent, we know exactly what freedom means. We know exactly what liberty means. We know exactly what justice means, which is why after 1947, the occupation, we had the Kashmiris come together to try and fight that occupation. And until the late 80s, it was relatively peaceful. And in the late 80s, that peace movement continued into the Kashmiris fighting the elections in Kashmir. Those elections were rigged. And this isn't, again, this is not my opinion. These are facts. These are coming from academics and historians and international bodies. And even the Indian government in itself, uh, maybe not necessarily the government, you can't call 70 years of government as one, but various different people in governments, uh, even intelligence agencies, um, specifically, uh, what's his name? A.S. Dolat. So indirectly said that, you know, these elections were rigged. Now, the problem is that the Kashmiris wanted to go through the democratic process. Didn't work. Those elections were rigged. So the people took up armed weapons to resist the Indian occupation. And that is when the tide turned. A lot of blood was spilt. And the movement for Kashmir started to transcend into a different level. And there was violence, a lot of violence. But it was on all sides. Um, the role of the Indian army has been in Kashmir, and now I'm fast tracking from 1980s, 1989, 1990, towards 2000, let's say 2008, uh, because there have been ups and downs in terms of armed resistance, what India would call militancy or terrorism, or what they call cross-border terrorism. Now, we also have to remember that, uh, you know, you can call it cross-border terrorism, but for if you look at the statistics of the number of armed rebels that have been killed, 99.9% .9 of them, okay, this is my opinion now, 99.9% .9 of them are probably going to be indigenous Kashmiris. So where is the insurgency? You have to use the correct terminology. There is no insurgency. These are homegrown uh, uh, rebels that, you know, no longer wanted to be occupied, no longer wanted to be subjugated, no longer wanted to be um, subjected to Indian state terrorism. And when I use the term Indian state terrorism, what exactly does that mean? Why did people take up arms? Why did people uh, co come onto the streets? And if we look at 2008, where the peace movement, you know, it, it, it exploded. In 2008, we had more than, you know, some people say a million, some people say two million, but millions, I'll say millions of people came to the streets demanding the right to self-determination, demanding freedom, demanding azadi. And that was in 2008 when the land row happened, the Amarnath land row happened, when uh, the Indian government wanted to take the take away the shrine board that was under the um, Kashmiri's uh, um, key. I want to say that they were they were handling it. I can't. I, I, don't, I don't. I'm not sure which is the most appropriate term, but they were the caretakers of that land, and India wanted to take it away. Now somebody will say, well, that that sounds very communal. I mean, the, the, the argument that India uses against Kashmiris, particularly the Muslims, that, that we are turning this into a communal issue, we never took it into a communal issue. Historically, the United Nations and even uh, heads of states have said, if you want to see the epitome of communal harmony, look at Kashmir. I mean, that is exactly what Kashmir was. And the argument about the Kashmiri pundits and the exodus of Kash Kashmiri pundits and the murder of Kashmiri pundits is also contested. Again, my opinion is irrelevant. I'll tell you factually what people say. The arguments are that hundreds of thousands of Kashmiri pundits were killed and uh, forced to flee Kashmir. The Indian government in their own documents say that it, it was a little over 200 that had to, uh, th that were killed or uh, just a couple of thousand that had to flee. And if you look at the statistics of how many pundits actually were in Kashmir, it doesn't measure up. And here's the other problem. There might have been a small percentage in every community, there are extremists, there are uh, um, uh, fringe elements that would claim that uh, the Hindus must leave Kashmir. But majority of those uh, people would never have allowed it. Historically, the pundits and the Muslims and the Sikhs and the Christians have always lived, lived in harmony. harmony. There has never been instances pre-militancy, pre-armed resistance, or pre what India calls terrorism, where, India, where the people of Kashmir, irrespective of their religion, we're not living in harmony. It has always been that way. Absolutely. Just, just to give you a moment to, to just probably take a break for, for, you know, five seconds at least, I would like to have a two-way conversation here. This is a very important point here, which we are making, because whenever we 
irrespective of my religion, when as a Kashmiri, I'm talking about the atrocities or anything happening there, I'm always imposed by a question, why didn't you stand for pundits? And it, it, it's, I pity them because it's somewhere, uh, they, are, they quickly draw a line of my religion and their religion. And it's not that we have been um, taking pleasure out of yeah. uh, whatever happened. Exactly. Uh, even if it was 200 or there were 200,000 people killed, but there has been killings. There have been killings in Muslims, in Sikhs and in Pandits as well. So we really definitely acknowledge that part of the whole uh, journey of Kashmiris as a whole, that we have been exploited time and again in, in terms of our religion as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And we blame Jagmohan. Now, uh, there are some people in the community, in the Pandit community, that uh, want to pl place the entire blame on Muslims. Um, uh, if we're going to play this game, then Muslims will also place a blame on Pandits for you know various different issues, which I don't want to get into because it's not fair. But in the interest of fairness, I should also mention that um, after the what, what we would consider Jagmohan's removal of Kashmiris, the idea was that Kashmir was going to be ethnically cleansed, similar to how it happened in 1948. And the, uh, what we understand or what historians say is that the pundits were told that this is temporary in measure and we'll be sending you back. Now we feel for the pundits, we really do, we want them to come back, they're part of our, uh, um, our the fabric of our society, the same way the Sikhs are, the same way the Muslims are, the same way the Christians are, they are part of that fabric. Uh, and we do want them to come back and we feel, we understand, we even recognize the fact that they have been used by the Indian government, they have been used by intelligence agencies, they have been used by fanatics and right-wing fundamentalists in India to exploit them and then to even groom them and to radicalize the pundits themselves against their own uh, brethren in Kashmir, which is unfair. And the argument has always been, well, what did you ever do for, uh, for the pundits? You know, where were you when uh, the pundits were being massacred and killed? Well, two points. Number one, I was probably too young and most pe people were probably not even born. I was, I was not even walking. <laughs> There you go. And I was probably too young to understand what was going on, number one. Number two is that, um, where, I mean, if, you re if we're really going to have this argument, where have the pundits been when the Muslims were being massacred? I mean, if, you, if we really want to play this game, no, which I absolutely yeah. don't want to, because yeah. it's not fair. It is a disgusting argument to make, but absolutely. one could make it. Therefore, we'll fast forward a little bit to 2008 when we had the peaceful protests and uh, millions of people came out and the, you know, the Western media suddenly uh, were attracted to Kashmir again. And even during the armed resistance, there was a lot of traction. In fact, Shabir Shah, you know, what Kashmiris call the, um, we call him the Nelson Mandela of Kashmir. And we will continue to have other people that are Nelson Mandela's of Kashmir, for example, Qasim Faktu, uh, Masrat Alam and various different people. But international, the international world knew about Kashmir. They just never intervened. And we talk about the United Nations resolutions, and there have been plenty of them talking about that the uh, that India and Pakistan need to come to the negotiating table, and they must consult the people of Kashmir to find the uh, solution to the Kashmir issue. And the at least at, at the minimum, the United Nations resolutions are building blocks. At least that is what we aspire for, a plebiscite. Ask the people what they want. The same way East Timor were asked, the same way the people of South Sudan were asked, and the same way the Palestinians are asking for. Right of self-determination is, as Alfred Desire says, who was a, a UN rapporteur at one point, he says that the right of self-determination is a conflict resolution model. Um, and therefore, this is what we want. So when we ask for the right to self-determination, based on the United Nations resolutions as building blocks. We're not asking for something that is unreasonable and unfeasible. It is not something un, you know, that has never happened in history. It is a practical solution to an ongoing conflict that is costing both India and Pakistan and now even potentially China. And the subcontinent suffers financially, uh, ecologically, even mentally. So that, every, every possible and, and most importantly, the people that are living in that conflict zone are suffering. Absolutely. Now, um, 2008 onwards, it was a very peaceful movement. We, we, we protested inside Kashmir and outside Kashmir, raised the issue of Kashmir in the United Nations. The Kashmir um, issue was even in the United Nations Human Rights Report, the Human Rights Commissioner's Report. It was there. News channels have picked it up. But then the argument comes far, fast forwards to 2016, when Burhan Wani was martyred. And I know that I'm condensing, and you know, it, it, it's condensing 70 years into about seven, 17 minutes. 
But Burhan Wani was then martyred and we saw the rise of more armed resistance in Kashmir. But the armed resistance was against Indian occupation. And the proof of it is not me saying this or academics saying this. It is the armed resistance, armed rebels themselves that were making um, videos. Nowadays, people talk about TikTok. In those days, it was Twitter, uh, YouTube, and Facebook. They were making those videos and explaining and justifying. And I think uh, the, the poster boy, if we can call it that, the poster boy of the modern armed resistance was Burhan Wani. And we must always understand why do people take up arms in the first place? I mean, there is no, nobody has pleasure in murder unless you're a psychopath. Nobody has pleasure in sacrificing their life. Nobody has pleasure in suicide, knowing that your lifespan is not going to be that long. And his justification or his argument was the fact that he was beaten and he saw his own brother beaten. He saw his family and relatives suffer under Indian subjugation and occupation. And let me explain now what that occupation entails. Let me explain exactly what the people of Kashmir have suffered through. Not only are there deaths, I mean, when we talk about deaths, 100,000 deaths, 200,000 deaths, people are desensitized. We see what happens in Yemen, in Syria, in Afghanistan, and all these different countries. We know what, we understand the concept of numbers, but do we understand the impact that it has on families? Let's talk about torture. Let's talk about, and, I'm, and most of these cases won't go beyond or pre-1990. I'm going to talk about post-1990, not, uh, not before what happened there. Most recently, just a couple of years ago, Samir Rah, five years old, he had a pin, a pin needle, puncture his eye by the Indian army, and then sand poured into it. Asfa Banu, eight years old, taken to a temple, uh, raped and gang-raped, and then killed by a massive rock um, over her head. We had Kunan Pushpura, villages, entire villages, where women between the ages of eight, eight years old and 80 years old, raped and gang raped. Asya and Nilofar, two women from my uh, town of Shupian, who were raped, gang raped, and then thrown into the river and then uh, claimed by the Indian army that they uh, drowned in, um, on the riverbed where there was no water because again, we have our ecology being destroyed because the riverbeds are being dug up. We have the cases of torture of Kalandar, who had his legs amputated. His flesh was cut from his body and he was force fed his own flesh. You have cases of enforced disappearances where people have been uh, disappeared for tens of, I, mean, I can't say a hundred, a hundred years, but tens of years, 10, 15, 20 years. Take the case of Parvina Ahangar, who is still looking for her own son. Or women whose husbands and sons have been kidnapped and never to be seen again. Now. I ask you a question, a rhetorical question. Women whose husbands have been kidnapped that have not been seen for 10, 15, 20 years, would you call them widows or not? You, they have no idea if their husbands are alive or not. There is a, uh, the, the, the term half widows has been coined specifically for the people of Kashmir, for yeah. women that have no idea if their husbands are dead or alive. Yeah. The torch enforced disappearances, mass graves, mutilation, um, uh, human shields, pellets, the use of pellets most recently. These are tiny, I've seen these cases inside Kashmir. I was in Kashmir a lot of the times when these things were happening, where I saw even, uh, we'll talk about the uh, case of pellets first. The pellets, they puncture people's uh, um, bodies and some people, it punctures their internal organs. And the doctors cannot remove those pellets because there is a chance that the person will die from it. My own cousin cannot go through airport security in India because uh, the, the, the machines start ringing alarm bells because he still has pellet injuries in his body. Kids that have been blinded, 18 month old Hibba, 18 months, not 18 years, 18 month old Hibba sitting in her uh, mother's lap is blinded in one eye. And I'll even talk about the young boy that we've probably seen um, on the news recently, who was where the Indian army tried to use it as some kind of publicity stunt. Uh, his name was Ifad, or his name was Ifad, who was sitting on his grandfather's chest when his grandfather was killed. He yeah. was about uh, three years old. Yes. Now that three-year-old, what kind of mental torture is he going to go through for the rest of his life when he saw his grandfather being killed and then he was placed on top of his chest? Or three-year-old Burhan, if people remember, um, Aylan Kurdi. Aylan Kurdi was that Syrian boy that washed up on the shores of Greece, I think, right. or Cyprus. Yeah. And then you had the other Syrian boy that was sitting in the back of a police van or an ambulance covered in dust. We have hundreds of those kids. 
I mean, the, the only difference is, the only problem is that our media inside Kashmir is crushed. Our media inside Kashmir um, are throttled. We have Asif Sultan who has been in jail for two, uh, for two years. He has a baby daughter, two and a half years old. She barely recognizes him. We Fahad have Shah, Shibli runs, again behind the bars now. Yeah, and uh, uh, Ghazi Shibli, he, he broke the news on, um, on Article 370 and 35A being abrogated. And he was lodged in jail for nine months. And on just the day before Eid, the festival of Eid, he was lodged again in jail. Fahad Shah, who runs the Kashmir Wala, who has been, uh, I think, five or six different cases have been lodged against him. I mean, these are innocent journalists. You have Masrat Zahra, who had the UAPA, the uh, um, uh, uh, Masrat Zahra, Pir Zada, Ashik, and Gohar Gilani, UAPA laws. Now, when we talk about laws, I know, I know I'm going on a bit. I've only got 10 minutes left. I wish I had another hour. But the, the draconian laws that exist inside Kashmir, Public Safety Act, where you can be locked up in jail for two years without trial. And we call the courts in Kashmir or the jails in Kashmir, they should have revolving doors because there are people that have been languishing in jail with PSAs for 10 years because every time they come out, they have to be put back in. Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Just understand the term, Armed Forces Special Powers Act. It's so special, it gives impunity to the armed forces. They can never be prosecuted and which gives rise to human rights violations inside Kashmir. Human rights violations that I don't even call, uh, I don't even use the term human rights violations because the violations are so extreme. We call them war crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, genocide, and now we are seeing demographic change. I don't know if you want to jump in here so I can have a glass of water um, and I'll carry on. I would actually love to because uh, when we talk about the atrocities, some people actually relate it quickly to um, the partition and then India and Pakistan created and that's how it all started. But we need to understand that based on what, when you actually mentioned the point that why did people pick up the arms? We need to understand that. And it's not that out of, we just, you know, the youngsters out of nowhere started picking up stones or even guns. There is a reason to it. There are teenagers, unfortunately, whose daughters, sisters were raped and tortured and they just they just didn't have any other option uh, especially since last year unfortunately we have 45 percent increase in the depression rates in Kashmir yes these things we we relate to it because we belong to that soil and Absolutely. when we try to explain that to the world uh, we are asked to think practically and that that literally pisses me off that you know how how are we supposed to think practically when if I take my own example, I was all alone in my city and my family was back in Kashmir. I had no idea what, how are they doing. Uh, I, I heard them, I heard their vo voice probably to, after two to three weeks. And I literally, I broke down. I, I fell on my knees because that desperation, that helplessness we had, it was so difficult to explain to the whole world that what are we going through? And today when people say, oh, we have the lockdown due to COVID, it's it's funny for Kashmiris, actually. Absolutely. You see, it's COVID is the best example that we can give. It is a very weak example from a Kashmiri perspective, but it yeah. is the best example. What people are now talking about mental health. They're talking about, they're thanking the gods that there is uh, um, 4G and Wi-Fi and all this stuff where we don't have it. They're thanking the, uh, the international leaders that at least we have the news coming to us when we don't have it. So COVID-19 is a, is, is a, is a very basic example that we can give to people of mm. what a lockdown means and you asked a very good question why do people uh, pelt stones why did people take up armed uh, armed um, armed weapons not to sound patronizing but i would ask everybody for a moment to close your eyes and imagine how a kashmiri would feel imagine how a kashmiri sees the world and he sees the in uh, the indian government and the indian army when he has to witness Tamanna, who is nine months pregnant, gang raped and gives birth to a son with a broken arm three days later, what is that young boy going to grow up thinking? What is another girl going to think when she has no idea where her brother has been for the last 20 years and still searches for him? What about that mother that I had to see on the streets of Kashmir outside the school that her son was killed in front of? And she still has not been able to absorb that information, and that is psychological trauma for her. You mentioned statistics. MSF uh, have uh, MSF Doctors Without Borders for other people, and and uh, Amnesty International 
and uh, Human Rights Watch have come out with many, many statistics, which I'm not going to bore people with, but let's just say that nearly everybody in Kashmir has psychological trauma, and every other person in Kashmir has witnessed some form of, uh, of violence. And we know, in, in uh, we're sitting in the West, for those of us that are sitting in the West right now, we know how the Western uh, governments and Western institutions recognize mental uh, trauma as worse than physical trauma. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that said, uh, when we talk about Kashmir, we must remember the causes and the effects. We should not only just look at the reactions that the people of Kashmir are creating. We need to not consider them as actions, but consider them as reactions. Reactions against the Indian army, reaction against the Indian government. We've recently seen in India, the CAA and the NRC bills being passed. We saw the outcry in the entire of India, and not just from minorities, but even from um, uh, friendly Hindus from the Hindu community as well, and all spectrums. I don't even want, I, I, I don't even like using the term Muslim and Hindu, Absolutely. particularly in, 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 in an India that claims to be democratic and secular. There shouldn't be this problem. And yet we are recognizing, now somebody will say, it's all because of the BJP and the RSS. It's so Not easy really. to blame the BJP and the RSS. The Congress aren't that, that much better. The, con with the moment Article 370 and 35A were abrogated by the Indian government, the Congress were the first people to claim that we have been doing it in, uh, um, in bites. Yes. And now the government of the BJP have taken the credit for it. They, they said, we have a, a Kashmiri phrase, and if you allow me to say it, is hamam mein sab nange hai. Absolutely. Us <laughs> hamam mein, Hindustan ki hamam mein sab nange hai. Bilkul, bilkul. Everyone wanted to take the credit out of it, but uh, when it comes to connecting with the people, nobody is ready to do that. They, they, exactly. want, they want to talk about the land, they want to talk about the soil, but they don't want to talk about the people who belong to that place. And, and we're seeing I, the proof of it by with the demographic change, the thousands of buses that are coming in, the 400,000 domicile certificates that have been issued. The, I mean, remember, the Israelis did the same thing in terms of domicile, but it took them 50 years. And it took India less than a month to do the same thing. Yeah, but I think uh, that's the point because uh, I don't think that this is this was just a month old process. I think it was a very old process wherein they were literally trying to inculcate the thing into the system. It was in their manifesto. Yes, and and also uh, you know I I felt that there was this kind this this hatred which was developed against the Kashmiris before just to prepare the non-Kashmiri mindset that, you know what, they are just stone pelters and nothing else. They only like violence. Whereas it's not the case. We, we wanted to have a dialogue. We wanted to have something, a two-way communication wherein we talk about things. All the countries are talking about us. West is talking about us, but nobody's talking to us. And that's a pity. You know, it's funny you should say, you, you, you brought up some excellent points, excellent points. And one of them was the fact that um, how the Kashmiris are demonized. And this isn't modern, uh, demonization. It has happened historically. If you ask Kashmiris that come from Kashmir and go to Delhi, Bangalore, any other uh, city and state in India, how they are treated, and they're always treated with suspicion, as spies, as pe as Pakistanis, as terrorist sympathizers. I mean, these are kids, 16, 17, 18 years old, that have never come out of Kashmir, never really experienced what 4G and Wi-Fi is. They don't really know about uh, the different brands that exist in the world. Internet and social media is a new concept to them at that time, and they're being branded as some kind of, you know, uh, um, a Machiavellian type of people. I mean, it's ridiculous. And even now, uh, in, in modern history, we've seen, be it the Congress Party, the B, again, I want to make this clear, I see no distinction between um, uh, the Congress, the BJP, the RSS, and all of them. I think they're all in the same boat. They're just different sides of the same coin. And we've seen how Kashmiris, during cricket matches, or, I mean, let me ask you a question. Is it a crime to support a different country in a cricket match? I'm pretty sure if you have a, I mean, as a British passport holder, when, when England are playing South Africa, I naturally I support England, naturally. But if, if, if I'll give you another example, uh, Kashmiris that support Pakistan, if a Kashmiri supported South Africa, would he be lynched on the streets no, of Delhi and Bangalore? No, he wouldn't. But they're always lynched when they support Pakistan. You can have, maybe Shahid the Free, these are great batsmen. I don't know. Maybe, um, what's his name? I mean, a cricket is go my head. Shweb Akhtar, the fastest bowler in the world, he inspires people. I mean, do people not, so, you, India have a great football team, allegedly, but I'm pretty sure that a lot of Indians love Barcelona, FC Barcelona and Real Madrid. They love yeah. Ronaldo and Messi. Does that make them anti-national? 
and yet the Kashmiris automatically and not we are anti-national. Let me make this clear. We are absolutely <laughs> anti-national because we don't recognize ourselves as Indians. Yeah. There has never been a plebiscite. We were never asked. As you mentioned, everybody talks about Kashmir, everybody talks about Kashmiris. Nobody talks to Kashmiris. Yes. And the confidence building measures that have happened in the past, it has always been about um civil society, it has always been, you know, um, it's putting bandages on cancer. As, as, as somebody very close to me says, it is putting bandages on cancer. You can have a bus going between Sirinagar and Muzaffarabad. That does not solve the issue of Kashmir. You can uh, create employment in Kashmir. That does not solve the issue of Kashmir. You can create industry and infrastructure and give people technology. Does not solve the issue of Kashmir, particularly in the last year when we were promised that a re revocation of Article 370 and uh, 35A, they can't Kashmir. At least, at least we knew where we stood. At least the international community uh, knew where we stood. However, here's the funny thing. I think, I think, maybe India shot itself in the foot because the amount of exposure, the amount of exposure Kashmir has now got after this is tremendous. We've never had this before, um, uh, especially when the Indian government called the New York Times, BBC, fake news, and the entire media fraternity started to lobby and support their partners. Correct. At the same time, it is a shame that even though I consider that India shot itself in the foot, that the rest of the world, particularly those that are sensitive to the Kashmir issue, be they Kashmiri or not, that we haven't been able to capitalize on this. And either that is our failing, or there is, uh, um, there is international relations and geopolitical strategic interests are more important than the sanctity of life in Kashmir. Right, right. Absolutely. Well, uh, I mean, when you said that, uh, you know, the kind of uh, approach as a Kashmiri, when we have it, we want to have a dialogue and um, it's never acknowledged. Uh, it's always taken in a very violent way, wherein uh, all we are, all we ask for is the is the plebiscite, you know, just to have a dialogue. And even I was about to say that that in last one year, I have seen tremendous, tremendous change in the emotions of Kashmiris living across the globe. Uh, I don't say that they were they didn't have Kashmiri before; they definitely had, and we always had. But this time, it's different. Um, when I spoke to a few people after uh, the internet, the 2G internet got restored and I spoke to them and they said that this time the reaction is not, it's not vocal, it's quiet. And this reaction doesn't mean that we are going along with the flow of it. It's it's a different it's a different sort of reaction. It's a it's a reaction of you know getting uh, feeling betrayed uh, or probably feeling humiliated is the is the right word for it. Not just betrayed because we somewhere had an expectation the system is not going uh, in favor of us. Um, but yeah, uh, Muzammal, actually, after such a wonderful discussion, I think we should quickly jump to the questions because we have a lot of them. Um, one of the first questions is from Anuban. He says that, hello, uh, one question, please. A lot of Indians, in brackets is even well-meaning, do not yet know about the depth, scale, and longevity of the Indian state's atrocities against, against its own citizens in Kashmir. Well, that well, I, I don't think that would really go well with, <laughs> with this, but lately the likes of Arundhati Roy or Prashant Bhushan among few trying to bring this problemat uh, problematic to the Indian mainstream, although partially successful. How do you see this? Is it the apathy of the Indian citizens behind this or the failure of the Kashmiri intellectu intellectuals to educate the Indian population? Uh, it's... I don't want to say it's a bit of both, and I'll explain why. On the one side, there is apathy in India. Look, um, uh, as, as disgusting as this sounds, I can't speak on behalf of every single Kashmiri Muslim, but I will speak on behalf of a few Kashmiri Muslims that always accuse the Muslims inside India of being uh, um, treacherous and traitorous towards their own kind. And the reason for that was because we warned them that if this happens to the Muslims in Kashmir, it's going to happen to you eventually. If you don't stand up for us now, uh, then nobody will be able to stand up for you later. That's exactly what happened. So there is apathy. And we, we still recognize that the minorities inside India, for them to speak up, it is a risk, particularly in this BJP RSS backed government. It is, there is a risk. However, where was the risk previously? 
there was always apathy. But the other side of the coin is this. The Indian media and the government has have always demonized Kashmiris. So even if even if somebody wanted to be neutral and somebody wanted to say something and do something for Kashmir, in the back of his mind or in the back of her mind, there would always always have been um, this idea that, yeah, but they're kind of terrorists, aren't they? Yeah, but they, you know, yeah. they might stab me in the back one day. In terms of the intellectuals, I would not say that our intellectuals have failed. The problem is that they have, been nev they have never been given the space. They've been locked up. They've been silenced. People like uh, Jalil Andrabi, was killed, who was supposed to go to the United Nations to testify. He was killed. You have people like um, uh, JKCCS, Kurum Parvez, Kurum Parvez prevented from going to the United Nations to give uh, the reports of JKCCS. Uh, uh, Parvez Imroz even. You have Fahad Shah, a journalist. I mean, on the one side you have the activists, but on the other side you have journalists, you have political leaders. Let's talk about Saeed Ali Shah Gilani, who has spent, uh, you know, decades in jail or under uh, duress. Uh, Yasin Malik, who's currently in Tehar jail, Shabir Shah in, in Tehar jail. The entire resistance leadership is in jail, is uh, is is uh, behind bars. They are detained. And even, even those people that were in bed with the BJP, people like the PDP, people like uh, um, People Conference, uh, uh, Sajad Loon, who considered who and claimed that Narendra Modi is my elder brother, was in jail until recently, and Mehbooba Mufti, the chief minister of Kashmir, who was uh, who 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 was part of a coalition with the BJP, is still under arrest. Under so arrest. you can see if that is the relationship India has with their own partners. Imagine what they do to those people that resist them. No, absolutely. I think um, see when you said that um, they they all are the part of the same coin means that they all have been trying to exploit this particular situation and keep Kashmir always a restless part of the world because they have their own stakes involved in it. But I think with the current government, the, the worst part was that uh, people who, who were able to get influenced easily got really badly influenced, leading to a lot of killings even in, in, in India because of you know the kind of hatred they have been able to develop in people's minds. Now, I don't say that BJP was the only government which is doing it, but it has, it has, uh, it has come out so violently now that it has become really scary for the whole country for them. You know? He is an excuse. It's a bit like Donald Trump's America, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, before Donald Trump came in, we never really know how right wing the people in America were. Right. He was an excuse for them to come out of the closet, so to speak. And the yeah. same with Modi, that the moment he came out with his agenda, with his philosophy, and with his team particularly, it gave the rise, it gave rise. To, now, either you can claim that, you know, fascism and, and the right wing nature was always festering underneath, or you can say that he manipulated people and, and conned them and brainwashed them. Whatever right. the excuse is, at the end of the day, it is in, an individual choice to decide what kind of person no, they want to be. Absolutely. We actually have a, a question related to that, actually. Uh, Abdul Salim has actually asked how to deconstruct these representations and stereotypes about Kashmiri people and then in Europe, probably. Maybe he's interested in, you know, working on that part of the world. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, missed, I missed the middle so part of the question. The question is how to deconstruct the, these representations and stereotypes about Kashmiri people? Well, uh, the, the, everything has a basis. The first basis of any human being, when you, when you look at another human being, do you immediately consider them to be a terrorist? Yeah. Uh, I mean, then, then it's, we call that, you know, if it's based on the color of their skin, then it's racism. If it's based on their nationality, then, you know, I mean, that's the first thing you need to do. You need to self-reflect first that what is your perception? It is not necessary that you need to fight on our behalf to do this first. First, you need to fight within your own community and you need to realize that there is the perceptions that exist um, to deconstruct them is going to be very difficult because you have a very strong and, and uh, persistent media and you have a government that is you know, channeling that hatred, but still, at the end of the day, a human is not born a terrorist. A human is not born an, uh, an anti-national if it's for those people that are in India. So uh, everything has a reason, cause and effect. I mean, I think that's physics. You know, everything has a reason. And so therefore, when people, particularly Indians, talk about Kashmir on the negative side, when they consider Kashmiris to be negative, uh, the first question that, uh, that should be asked is, why do you think that is? 
And if the answer comes back is because they are, they're born that way, I mean, then there is a fundamental problem. Anybody that says that, walk away, because they're never going to change their mind, the fundamentalists themselves. Break it down. That is how you break down the argument. You don't necessarily have to give them the, uh, um, the reasons. You ask them to search for it themselves, because a natural realization is going to be much more better than a forced understanding. I think um, I definitely can see some hope there because uh, the kind of people I have met from India in the last few months because of the abrogation and, you know, connecting with a group called Indian Alliance Paris when I became a part of it. The best part of it was that people there actually acknowledge the occupation and they actually acknowledge that there has been a lot of, uh, you know, I would say unfair ways of grabbing the land and uh, you know not listening to the people so i think i can still keep my hopes high for that uh, moving on to the other question uh Pankuri asks does abolition of article 370 contribute further towards mass migration of kashmiri youth what is the way forward for the government to provide economic stability well um so mass the thing is that look what opportunities actually existed in kashmir in the first place OK, so uh, most people, I think the, the from what the statistics that I remember, close to 50 percent are basically government employees. Right. And the other 50 percent, 50 percent are either, you know, entrepreneurs or working for some small companies. Now, here's the thing. Um, it is a conflict zone. I mean, would you ask the same question in regards to Palestine or Syria or Yemen or, the, or with the Rohingya, what's happening in the Arakan state or any other conflict zone? And I'm not saying this to be uh, uh, condescending or to be demeaning, but you have to understand the context. It is a conflict zone. There are a million military personnel inside Kashmir. What do you expect? What do you expect when you have uh, um, a violence in front of you every single day? So, but the people are resisted. There are so many... Uh, people inside Kashmir, entrepreneurs that have been so innovative and despite the conflict, while there was internet connectivity, they were doing superbly, they were doing tremendously well. Even after 4G uh, ban and, and internet ban and communication ban, people are struggling, but they're coping. We have learned how to survive. We are born survivors. And if we're not born survivors, we learn it pretty quickly. So I don't think that there would be a mass migration of Kashmiris. And at the same time, you also have to remember, where would they go? I mean, this is a world where immigration is being clamped down on. Right, uh, right. The world has become more right wing and irrespective of where you are. I mean, Indian Alliance of Paris, you're based in France. You know exactly what the condition of, 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 of minorities and migrants and immigrants are there. UK, just as bad. America, just as bad. Maybe to study and to educate. And, you know, not necessarily I would be in favor of it or against it. Those people that are traveling abroad to work or to uh, um, educate themselves, it's a wonderful thing. Build your better, build a better life. Also, educate yourself and then contribute back to society. Because people, I mean, you know, if there's one thing that's guaranteed in life, it's always going to be babies. So children inside Kashmir need to get uh, learn those skills that you're learning. So irrespective of if there is a, a, a migration, I would never call it a mass migration because I don't think there are that many opportunities in the world for Kashmiris coming from conflict zones. But people should go out of Kashmir, learn, evolve, yeah. grow. Um, and expand their horizons. And contribute, for sure. And contribute, absolutely. Uh, how do you see the growth of pro-India parties like the NC against the more radical elements <laughs> like the Korean? <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. Um, people like Farooq Abdullah, the head of the uh, national conference, is now saying, you know, maybe Jinnah was right. Even Mehbub mm -hmm. Mufti was saying, and her daughter, maybe Jinnah was right. These yeah. people are now talking about how Pakistan is, you know, is, 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 the, is the best idea and that we were so wrong and they, and they were willing to, I think just yesterday Farooq Abdullah wanted to have an all parties meeting with the leadership inside Kashmir of, on all spectrums and he was prevented from doing so. So in that sense, I think that kind of answers your own question. But from, <laughs> from, from a Kashmiri, but that's a, from a political point of view of where they're, lying, where they're uh, aligning now. However, yeah. from, a, from a Kashmiri point of view, I would never trust them. Ever, ever, never, ever. Once a traitor, once a collaborator, always a traitor, always a collaborator. They can never be trusted. Muzamil, I have a very interesting question. Would like to know what Kashmiris think about the future of Kashmir if they get independence both from India and Pakistan, their foreign strategy with respect to India, Pakistan and China. I think we'll have to end with this question because we will have Manish as well speaking. But I would want you to answer this question, please. It's difficult because, you know, Maybe it's an Asian thing, but you know, when a, when a child is born, immediately the parents say, engineer banega, doctor banega. 
Yeah, we don't have that foresight. The, the problem is when we talk about complete independence, we know, you know, statistically that we have, we could potentially have a strong economy. Right. Um, you know, theory is there, that's fine, but the problem, that shouldn't be the question. The real question should be, how do we get to that stage of deciding for ourselves? And uh, again, I, it may sound like I'm avoiding the question, maybe just a little bit I am. And the reason for that is that on what basis can I give that answer? I don't have a foreign ministry with me or even a shadow foreign ministry. I don't have an economics advisor. I don't, I mean, I, I've studied economics and I can give you the ideas of how it could be possible, but this is one Muzammil. Maybe an entire uh, um, population of Kashmir would completely disagree with me. Maybe they want to be with India. You never know. I mean, it's unlikely, but that's the point. You have to give the people the opportunity to decide. And then we would decide what our foreign policy would be. We would decide what our currency would be. We would decide how our uh, um, infrastructure and our e economy and how we run the ecology and how we you know, do things. It should be up to us. The same way the Indian uh, nation was given their right um, after the uh, expulsion of the British Raj, the same way we should be given the same. Right, absolutely. Well, that was a wonderful session, Muzamil. In fact, uh, someone has actually sent a feedback over the same that sh the person actually saw a lot of emotion and conviction in your speech. And I remember that when I when I heard you for the first time on Kashmir, especially, this is what actually struck me as well that there are these emotions which are lying in all of us, and we need to, you know, put them forth and just just express. As a, as a thirty second contribution to what uh, was yeah. said. Um, it's, I'll, I'll say 50% of it is in my DNA because my father was also part of this movement. But the other 50% is because I lived uh, uh, some years in Kashmir and um, I had to see and witness certain things and I experienced certain things myself. So when, when, I, when I speak about a, a lot of these subjects, uh, it's from first-hand experience. Let's just keep it at that. Thank you but very I would, much. I would definitely assure you one thing here that which really touches me sometimes that in this group especially and someone in the audience today as well has sent an apology to us. And that means a lot as Kashmiri when people say that, you know what, our country did this. Uh, and that's that's really that's really overwhelming. That's really, uh, you know, touching. And thank you so much. It was a wonderful session. Um, I hope to stay in touch and, you know, talk more about such stuff in future as well. Uh, I think we should uh, give away the floor to Manish now and uh, just listen to him. All right. I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, yes, Manish. All right. Well, I guess good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me out here? Prop, am I loud and clear? Uh, so far you are, but okay. I, it says that your bandwidth is low, so. I know that, so I just asked. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is it possible that you switch off your video for the, for the time being? Probably will have more bandwidth. I can, I can definitely do that. Is it okay. better now? Uh, we'll, we'll see, I guess. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to Summer Abzal for organizing this important session. It was absolutely fascinating hearing uh, from my colleague here, Muzumil, uh, you Thakur. I don't think so I can match that uh, at all. So just setting that floor already uh, for the audience to set the expectations right. And I understand that, you know, it is a historic day uh, for many that several that left several wounds, actually. You know, while for several, it left several victory laps also that continues till date. Uh, and for many, uh, on the other side, it also became a battle of narratives. Uh, which is where understanding the facts versus the myths and examining the political events uh, from the lens of Machiavellian politics, which uh, surprisingly Muslim will also alluded to, where the focus is on, you know, do the end really justifies the means that we have at this point. So I feel that as we, as we get into my presentation part here, I just want to have a bit of opening here. You know, today we are at the crossroads where the political spectrum has been shifted to an extreme far right. Be it, in, be it the usurping of the pluralistic values or Sorry, be- interrupt. Manish, is it possible to put the presentation in the presentation mode? Uh, oh, sure, there you go. Okay. Perfect. Better? All right. Yep. All right. So saying that, you know, that as we understand that today we are at the crossroads where the political spectrum has shifted to an extreme far right, be it usurping of the pluralistic values or be it the name, naming, hijacking the name of the Lord Rama, right? And we shouldn't let that hijack, be hijacked. But what is important in this entire process as, as we get into today's topic is to understand the distinction between what this government does, what this government represents, what political ideology it espouses in the garb of the Hinduism or Hindutva, what we have here. 
uh, you know, we say that Hinduism, as we mentioned, and again, this is all connected here. So that's why I'm kind of alluding to that. You know, Hinduism is a way of life, right? It's an inclusive value system that we have. Whereas the Hindutva is the only way of life. It believes in exclusiveness, the exceptionalism, and repulsive and to a large degree, what we call is also a supremacist attitude is and what we see happening in different political sphere, including what we saw with Article 370 reference also, and I'll bring to that in a minute. So what this supremacist ideology means is not only a different, is not different from a white nationalist agenda that what we see today in Trump's land, which also my colleague mentioned before in his talk. And in a globalized world, what I say that is we must shun, we must you know, categorically shun away this attitude of supremacy because as a children of one God, we must believe in truth, peace, tranquility, and inclusiveness. So what we see, what we see today is, and I'm quoting this from an article that I wrote earlier on this topic, the hateful hegemonic policies of the saffron supremacist fly in the face of the deeply spiritual, inclusive, and historically tolerant ethos of India. So one needs to seriously examine the religious claims of the saffron supremacist and the apparent religious governmentality that they represent. It calls for an examination of the spirituality and the love propagated by Bhakti and Sufi saints of yore. It also calls for making a distinction between Hinduism, the BJP and its ideologue parent RSS, the Rashtri Sayam Swayavak Sangh have used as a wheel to execute their saffron supremacist agenda and which is what brings us to what we see in the Article 370 and the Kashmir politics also. I also want to emphasize, I do speak as an Indian. So I have grown up, I've lived actually in Jammu Kashmir as a kid uh, when I was probably in my second grade. So my second to fifth grade, I was in Jammu, my parents were there. So I had some historical roots with that. And back in 1990, many of our friends during the exodus, they came to our schools actually, and we are still friends. So I do have the perspective of many Kashmiri pundits actually, who joined the schools that we all grew up in and we still are friends in. So I speak as an ardent Indian at this point, uh, you know, and bringing the idea of looking at this particular discussion and a debate from a very constitutional lens and from a very practical objective lens. I, I think in many ways I do uh, respectfully differ with a lot of views that my colleague presented earlier. And I do see where he's coming from. Absolutely, I do see that. I also, as a criminologist, understand why people commit crime, why people engage in violence. I do understand that. I also can understand the justifications for that. But then we all, when we understand those justifications, we want to look for the ways to be productive to make those ends meet rather than being counterproductive. So with that as an opening, my presentation is talk is, is pretty much looking at some of the myths and the facts and how we can move ahead. So I'll focus on pretty much five, four, four or five myths that were propagated to justify, to legitimize the abrogation of Article 370. So I'll have some screenshots there from the, from the contemporary news and we will sneak through the slides here. So one, the Article 370, as we understand, it was the special status designated by the special constitutional provision, also known as Article 370. And what it meant was that the state of Jammu and Kashmir had its own constitution, its own flag and take decisions except matters related to defense, communication and foreign affairs. And this temporary provision was included in the constitution on the October 17th of 1949. Then we also had the article 35A inserted, which obviously talked about the property rights and who could actually own the property. So these are some of the, again, from the constitution that we, in the India's constitution we have, but I'll just rephrase this. What this meant was in simpler terms, the article 35A, which was an addendum to the constitution in 1954 and the article 370, it gave the JNK the right to decide who its permanent residents are. And that clause further gave the special rights to residents in government jobs, when buying property in the States and for educational scholarship amongst the other. But now it's revocation changes that now. And that is also one of the critical elements that why this became a debatable topic. Uh, so which may obviously have long-term consequences in terms of demographic shift, which my colleague mentioned earlier, the economic opportunities available to its residents and to the people in coming in, and those who may want to utilize this new landscape. Although I do say that it's practically too early to say that as of now, given the political and the social instability in the region. So these are long-term long -term apprehensions that do exist and I totally sympathize with those. So, Talk about the myth number one. The myth number one, what was spoken on the floor of the Parliament of India was Article 370 was a temporary provision and it was not a permanent provision. These were the words for, of our Indian Home Minister, 
Amit Shah. So I looked into that, uh, that claim here. Uh, and I found that actually in 2017, the Supreme Court in, this, in the case of State Bank of India versus Santosh Gupta, what they observed was that even though Article 370 was labeled, and I quote, a temporary provision in the constitution, and the constitutional assembly had dissolved, the article continues to be in the force. And therefore they said that it indicates that it had attained the permanent status. And this is where that became the facts versus the myth. So now while we are claiming that this was a temporary status, the Supreme Court of India, which is the highest law of the land that you have, which has the jurisdiction to interpret the constitution also, by the way. Uh, so they actually said that this Article 370 has acquired permanent status. And this story, as you can tell, is from as early as, as late as April 3rd of 2018. So therefore, there was this little bit of confusion that was drawn upon to polarize people, to excite them out that, well, this was a temporary provision anyway, and we are not changing anything drastically here. So that's myth number one here. There have been legal challenges, obviously, to that, uh, to that claim. There have been several petitions filed in the Supreme Court against the center's notification on the JNK. Uh, and again, but there have also been claims from, from various bodies that do claim that the Supreme Court has been too slow to deal with Kashmir petitions. And I think we all have seen that happening uh, during our own lifetime in the last one year. And particularly during, I think we can also attribute a bit of that to the post-corona uh, COVID pandemic times. Also, the UN also had some crisis, uh, some uh, ish, uh, apprehensions and reservations about this whole move, and they did put out a statement. So there's also talks about the international ramifications of the moves that the Indian government made in respect to their Article 370 politics. So, you know, they were like, they're extremely concerned that the population in Indian administered Kashmir continues to be deprived of the wide range of human rights. And a lot of them was actually alluded to, so I won't really go much on those. But also we had here, the article, the what are the current status as of today or as of last yesterday, I would say, there have been several aspects where the Article 370 is being challenged. There are about 23 petitions that are still on the floor that are challenging the abrogation of Article 370. Uh, and obviously they are, like I said, they are pending uh, pending status. Then there have also been petitions against the lockdown. We understand that since since last one year today, actually we marked the one year anniversary uh, for, the, for the abrogation. So since then, there have been lockdowns, there have been freedom of expressions, challenges, there have been lack of internet services, uh, all sorts of human rights issues that you can imagine have existed in parts and in, in the pieces. So these are the four key aspects that we are as of today that there are petitions, 23 petitions that do exist calling out for the abrogation, then petition against the lockdown, which basically also talks about that how article 19, which is the freedom of expression that says that, you know, we all have the right to express ourselves. And obviously in, in, the, in the times that we are in, we clearly don't have that. So then the other one is plans for restoring the 4G services as also uh, my colleague mentioned earlier in his talk, you know, these are obviously conflicting petitions as expected. The state government says something, the central says something, or the Supreme Court says something else, or the, the, the advocacy group says something else. So now, as of right now, there's a scheduled hearing on August 7th, which where the government the obviously is being asked by the Supreme Court that they must restore the 4G services. Um, so that's the one position that we have in. Then there have also been some heaviest uh, corpus petitions where some political leaders have been, you know, obviously detained, we understand, since the time of this event happened. Uh, one earlier before under the Section 107 of the Criminal Procedure Code, and now later on the, under the Public Safety Act, uh, which is fairly draconian act, as I understand at this point, uh, given that it doesn't really leave, en leave any leeway uh, for people, you know, you, the state can just pretty much, you know, get you in. Uh, without having to give any response to that. So now her, her detention has been extended by another three months as of July 31st. And then Professor Saifuddin Sos, uh, who was recently in the news, also, you know, the government claimed that he's not under house arrest. And then there was this huge long video of his himself showing that how he was under the arrest, uh, under the house arrest, that was for his own testimony. So we can take for what it's worth in terms of the government's narrative and the actual civil society narrative. I'm big on the narrative. So we have to constantly focus on what narrative are we developing and how it has been developed and what does it really mean on the practical aspects. So that's about the myth number one. The myth number two looks at, it, it says that Indians could not buy, acquire property or land in Jammu Kashmir. And I say here true, but, and I'll explain to you, I'll give you my opinion also here. There are many states in India actually where you cannot buy land. And that's what I think a lot of Indians do need to understand that. I also didn't know that as I was doing my research, you know, back in the day, I was like, okay, so that's not, so this whole idea of that, 
you know, that Kashmir, as with the assumption that Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir is a part of India, which I ascribe to, then, you know, saying that, well, why can't you buy land in this particular, in this, uh, why can't you buy a property in this land? And to that, I would, as an Indian, I would say, I'm living in America. I could buy a house in New Jersey. I could buy a house in California. So why not I can buy a land in Kashmir, in Jammu Kashmir? Fair deal, right? Fair enough. So with that argument, I would, I could totally sympathize with that myth here. But where it becomes problematic is when it becomes the exclusive part of it and when people are not told that, by the way, there are other states also in India where you cannot buy the land, where you cannot buy the property. So that's what being objective enough about these, uh, these information, we need to understand that. So the, the, the one that you see on your screen right now, it's the Himachal Pradesh Tenancy and Land Reform Act that clearly says that you also, the transfer of land to non-agriculturists are barred and then there are conditions out there. So that's what, so therefore bringing this whole or polarizing people, just the fact that you cannot buy land in Kashmir is, is sort of a manipulated argument to make and again, to polarize people into looking into that. Then also there is article, you know, when we speak about the temporary provision and this whole land, uh, land act part of it, article 371A through article 371G, I mean, we abrogated article 370, which we're talking about, which is the central focus of our conversation today. But article 371A, if you look at that, it also, it's, it's about the state of Nagaland. And the same thing that you cannot buy land in the Nagaland also, unless you were a native to the state of Nagaland. So that's, so what about that now, right? So similarly, Article 371G, which looked at the Mizoram. So now Mizoram also has a way that they want to protect their ethnic, their racial makeup, their demographic makeup, their cultural capital, their language. So there are, there are constitutional provisions where they have, there are limitations to, I cannot, I simply, as someone who grew up in New Delhi, I, you know, all my life pretty much since I've moved out, I just can't go out buy land in Nagaland or Mizoram unless there were some other ways out, you know, for me to have a spouse or other things that would come into that in that frame of reference. So again, going back to the argument that you can, you could not buy land in Article 35A does that, then it opens up these different cans of worms, right? And you must have you some of you may remember if you followed the debate, as soon as the Article 370 35A happened, then a lot of northeastern uh, lobbies started up that are you going to now remove these provisions also? Right, because these are as temporary, as transitional, and as special provisions as the Article 370 was. So again, opening up a different can of worms, which I don't know, uh, and I'm not sure if it was at the time where, in the time where the India, where India as a country needs a lot more other things to resolve at this point. But that's my view here. Then looking at the political foundational history, I know um, uh, Muzamil mentioned about the the Black Day, I guess, of the 27th October. But I think it's important for people to understand uh, where this comes from. Now, these are the original documents, which are called the instrument of accession. I know you can't read on the screen, but I'm going to shift over to the next slide in a minute. So to me, as an, again, you know, as someone who grew up in India, born and raised in India, you know, and looking at the history, I guess, maybe the time capsule of 1947 onwards, and pardon me for that, you know, we look at the IOA as the plank of that relationship, right? So in that aspect, and this is where I feel that Indian government did let down. I, I do concede that in my limited uh, understanding of these constitutional provisions. So if you, and these are, so now if you look at the IOA, these are the snapshots from the instrument of accession, I'll say it IO, as IOA in the interest of time. It clearly says that the terms of this, my IOA shall not be varied by any amendments of the act or the Indian Independence Act 1947, unless such amendment is accepted by me uh, by an instrument supplementary to this instrument. Section number six or article six in the same resolution, IOA was nothing in this instrument shall empower the dominion legislator, uh, which is uh, India here, to make any law for this state authoring, authorizing the compulsory acquisition of land for any purpose, but I hereby undertake that should the dominion for the purpose of dominion law, which applies in this state, deem it necessary to acquire any land, I will at their request acquire the land. So you see how the owners and the ownership, the territoriality is maintained to the, to the, to the current, to the, to the existing, to, to the then ruler, Maharaja Hari Singh, and he took that ownership on that. The article seven talked about the nothing in this instrument shall be deemed to be a commitment in any way as so as to acceptance of any future constitution of India or to fetter my discretion to enter into arrangement with the government of India under any such future constitution. So these are very strong, powerful, categorical words to, to, to define the relationship between the state of Jammu Kashmir 
had between the uh, between India as a country, obviously, you know, to, to refine that relationship. And then nothing nothing in this instrument affects the continuous of my sovereignty also in and over the state. So that's something again. And finally, the, it says that I hereby declare that I execute this instrument on behalf of the state and that any reference in this instrument to me or to the ruler of the state is to be construed as including a reference to my heirs and successors. And I take a lot of uh, you know, careful attention to this last line here, reference to my heirs and successors. And which is where the current or the, or the political or the legislative assembly of the Kashmir would have come into play which obviously, you know, was not even consulted as we understand that, right? We understand that this was, you know, they were locked down or the, actually the government was, I think, under the gov governor's rule, if I recall correctly. So there's no scope for, for having a consensus building or having a conversation with the supposed, either the, the heirs or the political successors, right? And that is where I feel, where I've maintained that, yes, I mean, to my understanding, limited understanding, that it was, it was almost like a unilateral, like a one hand push that the government did here. So, but this is what the historical background is. Obviously it did, it did create a lot of reactions. We understand that, you know, Mehmoud uh, Mufti, Mufti called it the darkest day in the Indian democracy, right? And I think what Mohammed was mentioning about the decision to reject the two nation theory. And then she also alluded to that, right? Similarly, Omar Abdullah, a prominent, you know, name, uh, uh, in the in the political history, in the contemporary politics of India and the region, he also talks about it, that how you know he doesn't know what's going on, but calling for peace obviously for a lot of people, and also just an FYI, you know, for, for the viewers here, Omar Abdullah is also the grandson of the founder of the Jammu Kashmir National uh, Conference, uh, Sheikh Mohammed Abdullah, who was also referred to as the Lion of Kashmir. So there's a lot of political baggage there. There's a lot of political. Again, I'm not saying that they probably did the right thing during their their own uh, ruling times or when they were in the power, probably they didn't make the right moves. And I'm not really sure to, I guess, having that breadth of to talk about that at this point. Moving on, the myth number three, it also says, and this is something where Muzavil was mentioning about the statistics. So I did want to bring that up also. As a criminologist, I was really interested to see, you know, how the terrorism has shaped up in this particular time period. And this was particularly drawn upon, and I'm calling this a myth because uh, to me, it is a myth. It says that Article 370 was the root cause of terrorism in JNK. This was also one of the statements given on the floor of the Indian Parliament. And as a, as an as, inc as inquisitive as individual as I am, as a, let me look at that. And is this really the way? Is this really the root cause? So I looked at the uh, on your screens. You can see at this point a chart, which basically maps the data from the South Asian Terrorism Portal, which is a public platform. I think I had the link in here. Uh, I'll give you the link if you guys want to do your own data stuff here. So I looked, I mapped up the data to see how the numbers have, you know, appeared in the last pretty much since 1988 is as early as the data goes. So if you see here, you have the green is the civilians, the orange is your security personnel, and the, the, the red is the, the terrorists, right, or the brown. So as you can tell here, right around the 1990s, uh, where you had the insurgency period, sorry, around the 2000, you had this little spike here, right? Now, since 2000, you had the spike pretty much coming downwards, right? Like any, like a downward graph here. So that begs the question, and I, again, this is an open-ended question even for me to do more exploration on this data, to look at this Article 370 was valid until 2019, August 5th, 2020, right? So what happened between 2000 and 2019 for this 19 years when Article 370 was still prevalent, it was still on the books and we had the numbers were right from the triple digits to the lower double digits and in some cases even single digits, right? So if Article 370 was really the root cause of the terrorism in Jammu Kashmir, then probably the spikes should have continued to my assessment, but they didn't. And for the, I'm, I'm glad they didn't, but that does beg the question in terms of was 370 really the cause of the terrorism in, in, in the region? And that's something that I would, I hope that maybe Muzimil can answer for us, or maybe I'm gonna look more into that. Then when also I looked into, in terms of the statistics of how the numbers vary in terms of who are we losing more, right? So we had about, as you can tell, I'll just probably say here, and as a matter of fact, in the last one year, since the article 370, the numbers are starting to rise up a little bit. And I, I think for the reasons that Prof. Muzamil also alluded to. So pretty much in any given case, you can tell that, you know, we had almost, you know, let's talk about 2012 here as an example, almost 70% of the fatalities that happened were of the terrorist or supposed, you know, 
quote unquote terrorist here for the definition of the Indian government. Then we also had about uh, 15%, 15 to 50, 15% pretty much ballpark. I'm talking 2012 here as an example. We lost the security personnel and the civilians, obviously, you know, as a, as one, you know, uh, as a loss of lives. So there is a constant loss of lives. Obviously, that also happened, you know, whether it's happened from the terrorist aspect, whether it happened from the security personnel or the civilians, lives were lost. Uh, and again, that goes back to the same question, which is that if the Article 370 was really the reason for the root cause of the terrorism, I keep going back to the saying that, you know, why, how do I explain this decline here? What else was going on in the region? And that's something that we do need, we do need to study more. The myth number four was that, uh, that Article 370 actually hindered the Jammu Kashmir's growth. Uh, it didn't allow people to, or the state to grow. And that was something again, that was linked because again, and that's why, okay, so we're gonna abrogate the Article 370 so we can make more investments in the region and we can actually make it more flourishing. Because as I think as Summer was mentioning earlier, that whole the whole idea of the, the way the state was projected was, you know, first we dehumanize we people, we demonize people, we make them look like terrorists, we make them look like good for nothing, right? So in that process, you made it look like that this region was in, in absolute shambles, right? And why it was in shambles? Because Article 370 was hindering the growth, right? So therefore, that was the narrative that was again brought up in the public domain. So these were some reports from the Hindu, from very credible, uh, you know, news sources that we have all grown up reading, uh, and from nationally representative data sets. So this one, they said life. Let's talk about life expectancy. There are only two states, actually, as of 2019 or 2018 data, that the 2016 data that were actually performing better than Jammu Kashmir. So there were 18 states that were performing far worse than Jammu Kashmir. So if Article 370 was the reason why this was the case. I would say a tongue in cheek that probably let's bring the article 370 for other 18 states also so they could have better life expectancies. <laughs> then similarly, if you look at the people served per government doctors, right? So you had only about six states are better than Jammu Kashmir and then there are about 23 other states that are far worse than Jammu Kashmir. And again, if article 370 was the reason for this uh, supposed claimed lack of growth, then clearly the data doesn't support that claim. Rural employment rate, we see that again, you know, there are, I think here there are 19 states that were better than Jammu Kashmir, but still there's still nine states, a significant number, I would say, in the total of 28 states or so we have in India, you know, to be worse than the uh, worse than Jammu Kashmir. So and then finally we all look at the other side, you know, poverty rate. We only have seven states that are better than Jammu Kashmir, and the red dot obviously represents Jammu Kashmir here. You know, the seven states that are better than Jammu Kashmir and 21 states are worse than Jammu Kashmir. And guess what? The 21 states did not have Article 370. So what was going on there, right? So now you're saying that we want to remove Article 370. Okay, let's remove it, right? But then <laughs> how does it, you know, how do you bring the data together to say the right story that you are really claiming for? So it's a, you're, 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 so you're not really matching up. Similarly, infant mortality rates per capita state and the human development index, you had 11 states that are better than Jammu Kashmir and 18 states that are worse than that. So I think the lesson that I want to really, for people, for our viewers to draw upon from these two specific, very objective numbers, and these are not opinions here, these are pure and objective numbers here, is to, to not view the region of Jammu Kashmir as something that is in shambles or that was in shambles, right? It had its own economy. It was, it was again, I've had friends. I mean, I still probably think about look at this video on WhatsApp and probably say that what I said right or wrong later. But, you know, great guys, you know, great people, highly educated, highly hi hardworking class we're talking about. So in that process for people to assume that, yes, for the fringe elements, for the terrorist, uh, you know, activities, for the separatist movement or whatever happened, that probably I think brought the attention or unwarranted attention to the state, but that still doesn't mean that the state was not doing well on its own. And, and, and given that the government was also investing a lot more money per capita in the state of Jammu Kashmir. So it also can be argued uh, for that one reason, but, but we have to understand that to, claim, to make a claim that Article 370 hindered the Jammu Kashmir growth is a blatant is a blatant untrue statement from what it seems based on the data that I just presented. 
Then the article, the myth number five, and I'll be wrapping up soon as well. So myth number five was, it says that it disqualified women from the state of property rights. And that was also one of the things which was argued in a public domain that now, you know, the, because now it's a gender issue, right? And, you know, my, my own research has been on gender issue. And as any gender activist scholar would tell you that, yes, you know, how dare a woman cannot buy a property or cannot do things that she wants to do, as simple as that, right? So that was one of the arguments, again, that was made to very systematically, very manipulatively polarize people into overnight becoming a, the next gender scholar, right? So let's have the woman buy the property. Absolutely, let's do that. But the facts stay a little bit different, actually. So when I think it really happened, it was that the woman, now women and men were chairing the, uh, the equal property rights, right? Because the Article 35A has been removed. But the realities were actually, you know, different here. I'm going to speak to that. So obviously, the, the whole news flashes were that no woman, you know, are going to buy the properties here. But apparently, that no woman actually loses property rights in Jammu Kashmir if she marries a non-state subject. That was already there, established by even by the Supreme Court here. So in that process, this was again another, yet another manipulative tactic that was done to polarize the narrative. Uh, to shift it, uh, to make it look like as if something great was done when things were already settled in that process. Uh, then, obviously, there were statements, you know, uh, loose canon statements were made. Obviously, now we can bring Kashmiri girls for marriage, right? I'm sure some of you probably received some WhatsApp messages also in related to that. But I think you have to understand the theoretical, the, the conceptual part of those messages, the underlining tone of one, objectification of women, that's there, and two, because she is a Kashmiri woman, so therefore you can put any value to her, right? And that is something that I found deeply and I still find very deeply troubling. You know, so this is where, you know, you see the garb of patriot, you know, the patriarchy, the, match, the, the whole masculinity, which is what you see with the notion when somebody claims with the 56 inch chest, right? You know, that, okay, that's how you express your masculinity. You don't express your masculinity in the public by your intellectualism, which I find deeply troubling as an academic. <laughs> so moving on here. So obviously this whole incident, uh, this whole event resulted in a lot of, you know, we understand human rights crisis, uh, violations, you know, there was lock communication locked on. People were not able to call doctors at the time. Uh, we know all those stories. So these are some snapshots that you're seeing here. There were losses of businesses, obviously, where, you know, the people obviously were not able to communicate, were not able to sell under the complete lockdown. And as, and as someone mentioned that, and I wholeheartedly agree with you guys here, uh, my colleagues, Summer and, uh, and Mozambique, you know, with COVID, people understand that, you know, that what does a lockdown really look like, right? The question is, do they, do they sympathize with it? I'm not sure on that part. I can tell you that <laughs> they don't, they still don't sympathize with it because the population, the region has been demonized. The population in the region has been dehumanized to an extent, right? So that is where I feel that I, I feel a troubling aspect of it. But also the, we, are, we, we found some stories on the, how the JMK youth were being sent to jails, you know, outside the state also, just because they had to say something against the policies or the things or the political movements, uh, which was, um, Unfortunate, obviously, events to have happened in a democracy. You know, in a democracy, we're talking about the right to protest, right? The Article 19 gives you the freedom of expression, the Article 19, 1 and 2. You know, you have the right to protest, you have the freedom of expression. And, you know, as even as our prime minister would say, a dissent is critical to democracy, right? Dissent is the, is the key to democracy. You have to be able to express yourself. You may not agree with everything, but that having that dissent leaves you the room to come on a table and then talk about it, right? So, but anyways, that didn't happen, obviously. So you had 800 people in detention you know, everywhere. You know, you, again, like many of you mentioned about the half widows, people wouldn't know where their children were, where the youth, you know, the friends were. So those kind of stories obviously did the rounds in the last one year uh, post Article 370 abrogation. Then obviously somebody would claim that, you know, terrorists now when we go outside the state, you know, mobile phones are down, we are rotting in our houses, we do not trust any political leader. Uh, leaders like Farooq Abdullah, who stood with India, have been put in jail. You know, so this is one of the testimonies from one of the uh, uh, people interviewed on this story. Uh, and obviously, these stories are not my original written story. They're from source, and the sources are on the slides. Uh, then also, there was a, a fact-finding team also that went back, that went to Jammu Kashmir to look at what was really going on. And what they found was they also said that, you know, it's very different from what the projection was being made. And this is where I am a very, I'm, I'm, a, I'm very critical of the Indian media at this point. Unfortunately, the Indian media 
you know, what we see with the uh, with the Z News, the ABPs, uh, you know, the Astags, they are the glorified Doordarshan at this point. And when I say Doordarshan, because that's the Doordarshan is a state voice, right? I mean, they speak for the state. But now you have these fancy channels with fancy tickers, you know, and fancy anchors doing the stories. So they are like, they are not journalists. I think that's a shame to call them a journalist. In all honesty, I would be cringing if I were the professor. Uh, they are news readers, simple as that. And the narrative that they're given, and then they amplify that with the given voices they have. Uh, so in that process, you know, what we saw coming from the right-wing media, uh, and I would, I think I mentioned, I skipped to mention Republic TV. That's one other one. Uh, so they would, they would again set up a narrative which was contrary to the ground realities, right? Again, I also don't agree with a lot of things. I don't agree with a lot of things my friend Muzamil mentioned here, and I was very categorical at the opening of the call. But the fact that you have to be able to allow to exist, coexist those counter narratives, those narratives, it's very important for this for strengthening the democracy, which is where I feel deeply troubling uh, part of it as well. But anyhow, this report also mentioned about, you know, that they did not find one person, and these are not my words, these are coming from the report, they, they did not find even one person who said they were happy with the center's decision to scrape provisions in Article 370 and then lock down the state. So these are some, again, ground realities, testimonies of, you know, and again, now people could say that nothing is going on wrong, which I would say it's a classic gaslighting, you know, that, oh, nothing is wrong, honey, everything is great. So that's where we are. Obviously, this also resulted in economic losses, the human rights violation, uh, there were obviously losses for the Kashmir trade body at the time, but the loss for the from the shutdown in itself. And we are not talking about COVID shutdown here, FYI. We're still talking about the Kashmir Article 370, post Article 370 lockdown. It resulted into 10,000 crores of losses in, in the in the occupation trade that we had uh, as a result of the Article 370. Then obviously, you know, we had medical emergencies where people were not able to have their uh, hospital records being transferred from on the computer systems because the because the communication was down. Uh, so again, all sorts of violations, all sorts of degradation of what I would call quote unquote as human dignity. You know, I'm big on human dignity. You know, that's what we need to also focus on that, right? So so these are some of the stories that happened. And obviously, this one young doctor who I, who I believe was let go after a day uh, for the record also. Uh, so he obviously, as soon as he put out this request, which really says this is not a protest, this is not a request, please restore landlines and internet connectivity to all hospitals and medical establishments in JNK. And this gentleman was taken away, at, as you can see in the pictures here. And again, like I said, he was he was released a day after. But the fact that he was taken in in the first place, uh, just as a mark of what he was doing, that itself caused a lot of hue and cry at the given time, as we understand. Then the lack of transparency and accountability is another big part of this, I think, where it created a lot of problem with people like me, again, who, you know, uh, who understand from the Indian perspective or where we are, but from a constitutional perspective, from the government perspective, from the democracy perspective, I found that deeply troubling, which was a lack of transparency and accountability. You know, we understand this is one image actually where you see the opposition leaders, which was led by the former president for the Congress party, Rahul Gandhi, and they were at the airport and then they were not let in. So, I mean, if you have a clean house, who, why won't you want people to see a clean house, right? So it would create a lot of questions here. And I think this is where the government sort of lost, I think they lost a bit of narrative there, but obviously our opposition has been weak enough to not really highlight that and not capitalize on that. And again, I say that when I say capitalize, I say it from the perspective of bringing back the human dignity, right? Bringing back the restoration of this human rights or the fundamental constitutional rights. Because if you really believe the JNK now is part of India, which, you know, as I said, you know, has been part of India, it's under the Indian constitution, then every article that applies to everybody, who, anybody who's living in any part of India also applies to somebody living in JNK. How can you have a 4G connection given to somebody living in Delhi, Trivandrum, Mumbai, wherever, but not have the same 4G connection to somebody in Jammu Kashmir, right? That's a discrimination based on where they're living. So that's where I feel that if it's you're really thinking from a constitutional perspective, uh, that lack of transparency and accountability is where it lacked, but nobody, nobody had enough tooth, I would say, or teeth to really capitalize on that or question the government on that. And this is where obviously the media does play a lot of part also in subsiding such narratives to come up. Then we speak about the authoritarianism in terms of the government, right? You know, we often use these words and I don't use these words very lightly. So in all, in all fairness, you know, when you have 
when you have people who are dissenting, they are being arrested, they are being harassed, right? I don't know if Muzamil has probably heard any threats to himself or anything like that. I've been fortunate so far, even though speaking against it. But the fact that you could fear, the fact that you could fear that the government could come after you just because you're speaking on a very, in a very even in a very academic way also, that's not the right way for a society to grow, right? So you base, so that is where you see the authoritarian uh, streak there and which is a problem there. And then there's some obviously documented ways to highlight that as well. As you can tell from the screen here, some of the Kashmiri politicians, many of them actually refused to sign a bond which actually was banning them from speaking once they were released. So that obviously is a problem here. Then in one of those uh, clips where I found in my research was where how the government was forcing the detainees to sign a bond ensuring their silence on recent events. So, you know, again, if you have nothing to hide, if you have nothing, and I can understand from the national security perspective, I can understand that, uh, but up until when you can take the garb of that, right? So, because again, people will ask questions, people are going to ask questions. So, so those are the things where I find, you know, in terms of authority in the street is, is troubling here. Which also then find, then it also resulted into some in emerging international pressure that political response had started to come on India. The German the German Chancellor Angela Merkel also said that you know the situation in Kashmir is not sustainable, and this was again based on the last year's you know uh, quotes that we, they had. Uh, then also the Finland Foreign Minister also talked about that how the situation is not sustainable. Now whatever they meant sustainable, I may not agree or disagree with them. That's a different issue altogether. You already know my positions, but the fact that it created that international uh, center stage to this particular discussion, right? Uh, that is where I feel that we it was it was probably as an Indian, I think it was a little disheartening to see how uh, how our politics was kind of internationalized in that aspect. Uh, then also the ground impact of the communication lockdown. This really kind of knocked me out. In all fairness, you know, somebody actually uh, an author writes for print, I guess, uh, uh, for, and for other forums. He tweeted saying that if your mobile and internet stop working suddenly and they didn't work for months on end and you could not just fly to a place with internet, what would your life be like? How would your life change? What would you miss the most? And what would be your greatest fear? So very rhetorical question. The answer to that was, I kept brainwashing myself that all must be well with my family, parents-in-laws, two brothers, da da da. Then one day I got a call from the cop station, only working for the Srinagar, that dad was dead. You know, and it hits you. It hits you in the sense that when you see the real, real deal impact of these uh, totalitarian politics, right? These forceful politics that happen uh, again, which was unfortunate. Now, is there a better way to do that? Uh, I, I, I guess once in a while, I probably could come up with that. But sitting on the armchair here, it's difficult. As Muzamil was saying, we don't have the the half based foreign affairs with us. So. The, but the fact that it hits you that how real people lives were impacted or are being impacted from a very humane level, it should hit you whether in whatever side you stand, you know, as a human being, I would say that. So contextualizing this particular whole conversation, we understand that. We understand that there is right now where we are in, you see the strands of democracy being riddled with authoritarianism, with some with the totalitarian government governance also. You see the lack of opposition voices in India. I've called them pretty much neutering of the voices. And I hope that calling them neutering of the voices is not looked at as a disparaging way, but to tell them that we look up to your voices. So you must speak up and again, speak up for the rights of people, speak up for what is right on the constitutional grounds, on the procedures, on the policies. So that's something that I hope people would do. And also the 4G services, we hope, I hope that they're restored. So, you know, and including the releasing of the political persecuted leaders and the likes of the uh, Professor Source. The other question that I also bring up is, uh, and this is the last slide before I do that. Many people have also referred to this as, are we, are, is India in a, is on a fascist state, right? You know, is India going towards fascism or is fascism already here? So if we, I've had multiple debates with that, prominent people with, with every, many people. And what I found is that people would argue that let's not use the word fascism, because when you use the word fascism, it turns away an average person who really doesn't know what it is. For them, it immediately invokes the image of Mussolini or Hitler. And therefore, that was all now uh, historical caricatures. Now, it can't be for real, right? And that is why even fundamentally, principally, I stay away from the usage of the terms even like genocide, with all due respect to my colleague here. Uh, because again, you know, we see that how it 
it, it, we lose a lot of voices which may be a little bit right to the center also but but putting things in the context also to what fascism actually is and why i thought it and i think it is there we are there we just are not acknowledging it at this point uh, you know we argue that fascism is uh, you know one of the books by written by walter lacker it's called fascism past present and future he says that fascism is not a static phenomena and another professor from uh, from yale university joseph stanley he suggested that fascist politics attempts to dissociate people from reality where they are given an alternative versions grounded in nationalistic viewpoint painting an imagery about the country's decline and once glorious past and that only a strong leader can bring it back to its glory now with what is happening today in india right whether it happened in the last year or with today's celebration that probably you all are aware of right bringing back this whole glory that was lost once right uh, showing that the country has been declined in the last has been on the decline in the last 70 years and i am the one to take it forward so bringing those kind of narratives is where it does fit in classic textbook you know fascist ideologies or the political style here in other way in other arguments also in another author actually mentioned about how fascism is overtly nationalistic militaristic and expansionist so now when you see what is happening in the region of the state of jnk then i think those also you fit in there right you every time you talk about the jammu kashmir region people get into this hyper nationalistic mode of you know it's just it's a very difficult to really even communicate at that point because you just lose that you know there's just a glass wall in front of you so also what it mentions about that how the fascist ideology is focuses on the cult of traditions the anti religion anti intellectualism equating dissent with treason and that's very important part of it Uh, also appealing to the frustrated middle class who have what have who have nothing really going on for them and telling them that you know what i've come here i'm going to solve everything for you right so building up that invoking those kind of using those wounds and to some extent that was also what we saw with the with the wounds of the kashmiri pandits what the, what my colleagues mentioned earlier you you corrode those wounds you open up those wounds right to tell them that i'm going to fix them right when the wounds were probably already getting subsided but no you come here you open them up and you flare people up so you see those you see those classic textbook political you know mastery of that now and on, and on top of it you see the religious polarization right so that is obviously that comes in in terms of making this as a hindu and muslim debate also to this particular kashmir issue as well so so i think so so moving forward now the question comes is that where do we move forward from here right we are at a kashmir we understand is a is a frozen problem right there are multiple narratives that exist there are there are multiple viewpoints that exist and probably everyone has the right narrative in their own head right as passionate as compassionate muslim is for his narrative as compassionate as i will be for my narrative and so will samarvi and, and others be but to me looking at the way forward is looking at the last man and woman in the state of jammu kashmir right looking at the future generation of our state of our country so what i say is that to my understanding and i look at the way forward to me consensus building is a big part of who i am consensus building which must obviously begin immediately with the local and the political representatives to restore peace dialogue and integration of the people in jammu kashmir with india with a central focus on the restoration of human dignity uh, that's a practical point of view from my from my understanding then free access to press obviously must also be restored with the, without the threats of the psas which obviously gives state free willing powers as we understand that Uh, and also then to some extent international communities must take a note of what's going on right i don't ask for international communities to interfere into an india as a republic country you know they have their own business to do they have their own democratic parliamentary system but we live in a democratic we live in a globalized world where we are supposed to be held accountable to our actions to other countries right to our other brothers and sisters and from that aspect i hope that international communities do take cognizance of again purely from a human rights perspective right nothing else in here then the other part is the battle of narratives which is where i am big on we need to shift the narrative from the identity based politics to the issue based politics let's identify what are the issues that are hindering the progress of people in the state of jammu kashmir let's park some of the problems right let's steer away clear away from the separatist agenda for a while you know as long as we can as long as we can right separate it keep it separate here steer away but focus on the human dignity and core values of humanity for every individual that they need to survive and progress and thrive just like all of us are here thriving at this point 
then focusing on developing a united, secular, and progressive future for all of us. And finally, uh, this will be a remiss if I didn't say that, developing the social, electoral, and political capital. We understand that today, what BJP was able to do is purely because of the social and the political capital that they were able to build on. And, for, and that didn't happen overnight. We understand that. That was going on for decades and decades, right? Finally, they got this majority that they were able to pull this rug that they did. So the question becomes is that if, you, if, if the people of Jammu Kashmir do not get politically actively involved into the agenda of a progressive politics and progressive politics where the last man and woman and the child is not, is not injured, is not hurt, is not killed and goes to the school, goes to education and lives life just like any or normal average individual should and must. So I think developing, taking that electoral battle is I think very important also to have a voice in the agenda setting. So that is where I would also focus in terms of shifting of the narratives. And that would be my spiel here. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Manish. That was a wonderful connect with the audience. And I think I'm really happy about the fact that I structured by, you know, making, I mean, requesting Muzamil speak first and then you, because we actually glided through the history of Kashmir connected a bit with what is actually happening, the reality, and then you spoke about, you know, the atrocities. And it reminds me of a time uh, a friend recently told me that uh, he's from a state from India, and he said that, you know, initially I was not at all connected with what was happening there, and uh, the realization came pretty late. And on August 5, I remember that I was having French fries sitting in my living doing nothing and I got to know that, you know, this is this abrogation happening. And it made me, you know, it, it forced me to, to think about it, that unless it's a human tendency, you know, unless the pain doesn't come to us, we really do not relate to it. But the sad part is that in India, I don't want to say it, but it is a fact that majority of the people are not able to relate to the pain which is happening just next to their country. But Absolutely. they are able to stand for Syria, Palestine, uh, today, uh, Lebanon. For Black Lives Matter. For, black lives matter. Black lives. <laughs> for, for them, black, black lives matter. But then Kashmiri right. life, you know, you know, it's for the Vikas, yeah. whatever is happening. And right. on the abrogation of 370, when I was not able to speak to anybody from my home, there were people from, you know, different states of the country messaging me that, you know, you need to give it some time. It's for the development for you guys. Mm -hmm. And... I really cannot explain it into words what was happening inside me because I couldn't explain. I failed there. But I mean, if you let a Kashmiri speak about all this, we're going to take ages to talk about it. But just to club the questions together, a couple of them together, um, uh, Manish, I would offer you and Muzamil both to talk about it uh, because this is pretty much related to what you were talking about and also Muzamil, uh, what he spoke about. If the BJP is no longer in power, do you think that Kashmir would regain its lost status? Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, I got the answer from Muzamil with a, with a big no. Uh, the, question, the other question is, how much change in Indian media attitude have been perceived by Kashmiris after 370? Well, as a Kashmiri myself, we don't trust them. Right. We, we, we don't even look at, look at the Indian channels. But anyway, if you guys would like to give your opinions on that, please. I'll let Muzimil start and then I'll take over. Uh, in regards to the, thank you. In regards to the Indian channels, I mean, uh, frankly speaking, does anybody here actually watch the Indian channels? And if you do, do you believe anything that's being said? Um, so it's kind of the same with us. Uh, in regards to the question that whether uh, if, if the party changes something is going to, maybe the, the statehood would return. No, I don't think it has anything to do with the... Uh, the change of government if it was to return then it would be done by the bjp um because uh, if the congress came in um the congress one of the first things the congress would do to stamp its stamp its authority would be to at least pave a way towards statehood back and if the bjp felt that uh, that's a possibility then they'd do it first i mean it's it's games isn't it um absolutely right uh, 
I echo that. You know, like I said before, one, I don't trust the Indian media also. And I think we all have our own. I think, unfortunately, we all have our own echo chambers to trust the media, what we do. But, you know, as someone who teaches on critical thinking also, I often tell people that, you know, look at the sources, look at the narrative that is being built around and look at the sources and how it is being projected, right? And, and there are days when I would listen to CNN and Fox, both both I would listen to both of them, just to see how the different... Uh, narratives is being projected. So, but but somewhere you can see the cartoons on the TV and I'm calling them cartoons because they really are cartoons. I mean, they are, uh, and I speak as a, uh, in my professorial hat, I mean, this is, I don't know how the School of Journalism de deals with them. I'm kind of short of words at this point. Why don't they rebuke them? You know, that this is not, I would not want my kid to go to the School of Journalism if this is the kind of reporters we are going to have in India, right? And I'm pretty sure that the School of Journalism in India do a fine, damn, damn, damn fine good job. But clearly those people are not making up to the media that we see on the television at the end of the day. So, so I think there's somewhat that disconnect. So I hope that kind of tells you about how much I like my the Indian media, particularly the one that only come and shout on the television. Anish, we actually have a question for you yes. uh, specifically. Why in your shifting of narrative section, you are not setting up any room for a plebiscite? Okay, uh, that's a very interesting question. So I think the reason I am not setting up a plebiscite because if you look at the, some of the UN resolutions for the plebiscite to happen, a lot of involved, which is, if I recall correctly, one of the resolutions from, that was one of the first resolution in, in United Nations that was tabled. For a plebiscite to happen, a lot of uh, forces from the Pakistani occupied Kashmir has to go back, the Indian occupier has to go back. So there are a lot of factors that are associated that are part of convoluted. So it's a very convoluted problem. So I don't think so that India, even unilaterally can say or should say that yes, we are going to have a plebiscite because that plebiscite is conditional on a lot of different factors. And you know, absolutely, I, that, that's I, pretty much true. But it, it was never right. a unilateral uh, problem. That's, right. that's the point. Right. Because, right. You know, right. Right. according to me, yeah. in my personal opinion, when I look at the South Asian society, this is the problem that that society is not conditioned to ask why did this happen. So right. when you initially spoke about uh, that there are certain laws in Kashmir that people cannot buy the land. There was a reason right. behind it. There was a history behind it. There were certain clauses behind it. And right. as Kashmir has always been a disputed territory for a lot of different reasons and stakeholders around them, there was a reason why it wasn't, uh, you know, permit permitted for any person to buy a land there because it was still not, um, right. you know, settled case. And I think this right. is definitely something... Um, I mean, plebiscite would definitely happen only when we have the bilateral thing, only when, um, you know, this side right. of, of the globe would actually agree. Exactly. Right. So, so, you know, so for me to say that, yes, India should have a plebiscite, I think is a half-baked story because then one would say, well, you know, is Pakistan going to withdraw their forces? Because that's conditioned on that. Absolutely. And it, it, I don't think so. I don't see that happening. <laughs> We have one more question about a bit about education in Kashmir post 370. Mm-hmm. Uh, people want to know what do you guys think about, you know, uh, what would happen to the educational system, probably. So I so I think I, I'll say it on the surface here without having scratched it too deep here. I mean, clearly, you know, when we look at the digital divide in India to begin right. with, right? Uh, I think my I think what what 70 30 percent something like that. If I mean again, I'm going to verify the numbers here. There's a huge di digital divide to begin with. That's one. On top of it, when the digital divide is also due to the within the region, which is not having the the fastest speed of the internet, or even the one that you, I mean, I can't imagine 2G connection would let you have an online class lecture. Like right now, I'm sitting in the United States here, and I have my video so that you could actually hear me out, right, for the bandwidth purposes. So now, when we're looking at the lack of bandwidth in a, in in those places, uh, I am I am sympathetic, and I I feel bad for that, and that's why I keep saying that. The narrative has to go back to how the last man and the woman and particularly the future generation of our region is suffering due to stalemates, right? These stalemates are only helping the political parties hear their own voices, but it's not really helping the common man and the woman on the ground. So that's where I, I so I, I'm sorry, I'm circling back to that. But I think the question is, we need to, the education, I'm sure it is suffering, but I don't really have the data to support that at this point. I think it would be naive for me to say that education is not suffering, particularly due to the lockdown, initial lockdown post Article 370, and also due to the COVID lockdowns that we have seen as a result of that. Was I hope that you to add something? Thank you, Manish. Um, 
Yeah, well, yeah, oh, everything that uh, Manisha said is pretty accurate. Um, the, 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 although the education system has kind of suffered in the last year, the, it, it, that's the institutional educational system. We've seen in 2014, 2016, and, and many different years when crises happen in Kashmir, people kind of get together and they open up um, um, classes in, the, in, in bedrooms or in the hall or in the, in the, in the field. So they, they do tend to learn. And it's a, it's a, I don't know whether it's a miracle or whether it's a skill, but uh, Kashmiris have been struggling, even though struggling with education, uh, and having to be self-taught, they're still getting into Oxford University, they're mm. still getting into Harvard University, they're still managing. So that in itself is a great achievement. But um, I think beyond that, uh, the education, I think that there might have been another part to this question in regards to education, if I'm assuming right, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But I think the, um, because I used to talk about the education system in Kashmir in the sense that how India have been slowly but surely and methodically changing the narrative in our book so history is no longer real history it's more about uh, um, uh, hindu mythology or you know things that aren't really relevant to kashmiris um the syllabus is changing and you know different schools that are based in india that are coming into kashmir what we call outsider schools are coming coming in with new syllabuses and new um uh, forms of education and what we used to learn if you if i speak to my cousins and my and my relatives there that are older versus the younger ones, uh, they keep on sending these kids to these newer posher schools because they seem to think that there would be more opportunities later. So uh, the natural language in, in Kashmir was always uh, to speak in either Kashmiri, which that isn't the really natural language, it's kind of a home language, but it's Urdu, it has always been Urdu. But now when I speak to my cousins, I have to speak in, well, not that I can, but they speak in Shuddha Hindi. And I mean, how am I supposed to how am I supposed to work with that? Um, so you can understand the education system is shifting. Um, and I think, um, if I if I may, I, Manish and I may disagree on many things, and he may disagree with me on this. But if you want to corrupt a society, you take away their their history, you take away their culture, you take away their language, you take it. So this is an, another form. And uh, for on the other side, I can see why an Indian that is pro uh, um, uh, unifying Kashmir into India, because they would say, well. It's part of India, so they should be speaking Shuddha Hindi. They should be speaking this. But then again, if no. I go into the reverse, people in right. Telangana they don't speak right. Hindi. Right. People in West Bengal they have. And just so, a, just a quick just a quick just a quick add on to Muzamil here. Not I'm sorry for interjecting here. I am absolutely for coexistence of multiple narratives. I think it would be shame for me to say that that they should that that the Kashmiris should only be taught Hindi and not taught their own language. I think that I believe in, strongly in federal structure. I think that's one thing that I wanted to add also. Moving forward, how do we strengthen the federal structure, right? And what does that federalism really mean, right? The federalism is that okay, we have the state, we have the center and the power, but then each state had its own has its own unique identity also, right? So I think and being respectful of that individual state identity and that is marked by the culture, by the language, by the shared values, by you know the the, the belief system they practice, I think is extremely important. And that is why when someone says that, you know, it's one India, yes, it is one India, it is under one constitution, but then we are also a pluralistic society. And that pluralistic society, there has to be room for the pluralistic society to exist, which means somebody from Mizoram, Nagaland, they want to continue with their language. Who am I, Who who's the home minister to tell them that, no, you must learn Hindi, right? I mean, you know, so those are kind of things, I do agree with you completely on that. I think the language is the window that to- That actually reminds me of a very recent incident wherein a, a young boy has been, I mean, uh, behind the bars in UP jail and uh, his mother actually traveled all the way from Kashmir, living in a village to UP jail and she doesn't know any other language other than Kashmiri. She was sent back based on a condition that either you speak in Hindi with him or right. you don't with him. But, and see, that is what the saffron supremacist agenda I keep bringing back to and what we need to understand that, right? When right. we talk about the narrative, we are, we are going back to the saffron supremacist agenda where we are looking into the exceptionalism of Hindutva voices, right? That only this is the only voice that must exist. And that is what we all are fighting about. That is what we all are trying to say that, no, you know, you can also exist, we can also exist, right? Let us coexist. So, yes. So we have one question. Uh, what are your thoughts on the radical Islam turn that the independence movement has at times taken? Could be as simple as Gilani opposing the left or as, as radical as Musa advocating implementation of Sharia, or is that a misrepresentation of the movement? Muzamil, would you like to answer that? Uh, well, um, 
if Gilani Saab condemns the left or Zakir Musa wants to implement Sharia, um, if, they, if they can show me a path of how that's ever going to happen, then yeah, we can discuss the subject. The problem is that we're nowhere near anywhere. I mean, we're, we, we, when we talk about climbing the ladder or, or, or walking the path, we're not even on the first step. I mean, we can't even see the step. I mean, we don't even know where the step is that we can even talk about these things. So these are uh, people's ideological opinions. Uh, it does not necessarily wash with everybody. Uh, you can see the two polar opposites um, yeah. in even within the within the Hurriyat camp, within the JRL. Some are secular, some are uh, religious, some are uh, um, advocate for pro-Pakistan, some advocate for pro-independence. So, but that is that is an internal uh, struggle within ourselves. And then at the end of the day, if the plebiscite, and I know many people will disagree with the plebiscite, whether it should happen or shouldn't happen, but in the theory that it should, and that is that it is agreed upon, that would be our problem to decide. And it would be an internal matter for uh, in Kashmiri, we say tol tol karu, which means to, to, to you know, bash heads with, between each ourselves. With the head. <laughs> yeah, so when rams uh, ram their heads towards, I mean, that's for us to discuss how it how it evolves and what we decide and, you know, who has what position. I mean, it's too early right. to even discuss right. these things. Right. But it is a good question and we really should. I mean, if we want to get our right. act together, we want to get to that stage that we really right. do need to figure out what our narrative is. Nationalism right. in Kashmir versus nationalism in India, the perils and differences. Well, the nationalists in Kashmir are, I, I would, I would assume, because look, a national, an Indian nationalist is different to a, an Indian radical nationalist. I mean, you, we have to make, I mean, I, I would never, ever call an Indian that is patriotic, you know, a nationalist in a derogatory term. Well, you're supposed to be, you know, I mean, if you're proud of your nation, you should be. Uh, and the same goes with any other nation. Um, so mm -hmm. a Kashmiri nationalist, that idea of nationalism is, is identity. So, so it's the identity that we want but is it the identity that we want at the cost of somebody else then that's the question that's the real question absolutely, isn't it? absolutely. Right. Right. um for once assuming the populist notion that all that has been said about the kashmiri ethos is wrong and that the kashmiris are driven by rapid uh, fundamentalist hatred of secular slash hindu india to raise the demand for self-determination as embittered immigrant pundits say is the denial of the right in the name of refusing of acknowledge the legitimacy of communalism a justifiable attitude as many leftists in india seem to think any any comments on that uh, i i got the gist of it i i heard uh, most of it there was an airplane flying past so i lost <laughs> some sound but that's, that's um, pretty much uh, that's that's a very long question actually uh, if you guys want i can uh, probably repeat it is it if i'm actually i'm actually reading it and i'm trying to make sense of it so <laughs> yeah it, it's more Pardon. like a question and a comment together so right. probably if the person would rephrase we can ask it again that would be so, nice uh, yeah. guys, but I, if while you're looking at that, if I can just quickly add something to what before Muzamil was saying and our please. questions were saying, I think we want to not lose our focus on the micro issues while we are talking about the macro issues, right? You know, we understand the plebiscite is a very macro issue, which is highly conditioned on so many different conditions that which we all don't know whether it will happen in our lifetimes or when, right. even if it will happen or not, because condition so many things. But what is in our control is those micro level issues, right? Which is again, going back to the people, right? And their growth and their success. So I hope that in that, in our discussions, uh, as we talk about that, we don't lose the battle of those micro issues because they impact the people on the ground. Uh, they impact their growth, you know, and their future generations. So I just want to add to that here quickly. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Someone had actually asked that uh, if we could give a quick exact history of Kashmir, not trying to blame who started what, but uh, I think that's a very, very long uh, answer to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the person wants to have certain sources, wants to read about it, most welcome, let us know. We can probably ask Muzamala and Manish to share the links with us. Right. All right, guys. Sure. Uh, I hope I haven't missed any question. I tried to cover up. Um, so there is one comment coming in. I think the morally correct narrative for progressive Indians is to start Voiceously supporting is the right to self-determination for Kashmiris, as long as common Indians keep supporting federalism and integrating Kashmir in the mainstream, we will keep integrate, we will keep Kashmir under our occupation under various disguises. But I would love to hear from Samar and Muzamil regarding this. 
Um, here's the thing. As, as, as much as I want the average Indian to support the right to self-determination of Kashmiris, and I want them to support our cause unconditionally, um, it's unrealistic to expect that because those that are living in India, um, and this is not just necessarily about being lynched on the streets by the BJP and the RSS, but it's not necessarily going to uh, marry well with other people that believe in Akhand Bharat, yeah, you know, one nation, maybe using the term Akhand Bharat is slightly different, but, you know, believing in the territory of India, it's not always easy for them. Um, and maybe to some extent, um, I would agree with Man Manish that, uh, you know, we, we can't lose the uh, focus on the micro issues. But at the same time, you know, uh, by saying that, I still don't want to be able to, I still don't want the, the to be an opportunity to lose focus on what the macro issues of Kashmiris. And maybe I would respectfully disagree in terms of what the people on the ground actually want. I mean, if you ask them, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, I don't want to use some of the slogans because they're quite extreme, but people are ready to give their life for uh, what they want. And, you know, uh, Burhan's father, if you ask him, he said he has he says, I have other sons, I'm ready to give them up. I mean, I know I know mothers that have given up five children. They said, I wish I had I wish I had a sixth. So uh, maybe these are you know examples far and wide and in far and in, you know not too close to each other. But the reality is people are fed up of the status quo. People have never really wanted Sadak Bijli Bani. Um, they've always wanted something more. And whether that is realistic uh, in terms of uh, attaining by India is a different question in itself, but we must recognize the demands of the people in itself. And then what Indians can do to at least get to a stage where there is there are common minimum agendas. And then, you know, we can part, part ways uh, where we see differently. But to expect, I mean, I wish every single Indian could support the right to self-determination, but it's not realistic. And those that do, I hope they do it unconditionally. No, no, absolutely, Muzamil. And I think uh, when I started uh, talking about such things with my friends and people I didn't know at all uh, who are from India, I definitely had that fear in the beginning that, you know, will I be taken well or will I be taken positively or not? Will I be targeted or not? So there is always that hesitance inside us. And I think with people coming coming for, forward and letting us know that yes, they acknowledge what has been happening. It's definitely a great start to, uh, you know, support what is happening and, you know, standing in solidarity with, with the Kashmiris. But trust me guys, this is, this, is not a sh this is not a short battle. This is not a short fight. It has been there for ages and decades. And um, I, I definitely see it as something extremely emotional for us. And when we see that support coming from different people, coming from different countries, different cultures and backgrounds and acknowledging it, that yes, this is happening, it definitely, it definitely has got a difference in our minds because we've always been hearing and listening to those responses that nothing of that sort happened. So either we are lying or we are into some other, you know, world and we just, we were just dreaming, dreaming about it. So the approach really matters. And I think I have seen uh, a really positive attitude of a bunch of people here coming from India, acknowledging it, that, that is definitely a good start for us. All right, uh, there is this conversation I was having to one of my Kashmiri friends about what to do Kashmiris want in light of political status of Kashmir. And she claimed that Kashmiris want an independent status to not be with either India or Pakistan. What are your views regarding this claim? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, that is, a, I mean, there are even people that wanted India until, uh, you know, pre abrogation of Article 370 35A, just ask the National Conference and the PDP. Right. Uh, now ask them, I mean, <coughs> emotions and aspirations evolve over time, uh, especially with knowledge and experience. Um, and there is a very strong sentiment. I'll say the majority of the sentiment is between Pakistan and complete independence, but it fluctuates. Yeah. yeah. So when 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 you had when Pakistan wins the cricket, uh, if Pakistan ever wins the cricket uh, tournaments, then yeah, then everybody will want to be part of Pakistan. Yeah. And then uh, if Pakistan loses to India in a cricket tournament, then people will curse Pakistan. I mean, it's. It's evolution, but again, I will always say the same thing, that it doesn't matter whether a person wants India, whether they want Pakistan, whether they want independence, just give them the right, give them the opportunity at, at least, if not decide, at least to speak about it without having the threat of being lynched. 
And I think uh, the extremists in India who have got their patriotism pretty much linked to what is happening in Pakistan is it's pretty much uh. the same, you know. Uh, for Kashmir, it's all about the plebiscite first. Uh, what the majority decides, that's a different, that's a secondary stage. The primary stage is, are we, I would not use the word allowed because the right has been snatched away. It's not, a, it's not about the permission, but will they let us speak on our own behalf or not. That's the primary uh, stage of it. And we need to evolve through this journey. But, but this is a very complicated problem. We understand that, right? Like we mentioned about the plebiscite you mentioned, then we talk about the 1972 Shimla Accord where you know there's a bilateral agreement in how Pakistan and India has together to resolve any issue that pertain into the uh, to the uh, to this whole issue of Jammu Kashmir as a one part. So again, the, it is such a convoluted, frozen in time problem uh, that uh, I, I think it's uh, yeah. It's we can have multiple discussions, I guess. And I hope in those discussions, we just don't lose focus on what the common people need. And I think I keep going back to that, which is okay. Now the Article Three Seven has been done, and I'm not being an apologist here. I've spoken mostly against the unilateral totalitarian abrogation of Article Three Seventy. I think the question is, now that it is done, how do we hold the Indian government accountable for it? When I say what I mean by accountable, how, are we making sure that we can hold them accountable to giving the rights, as you mentioned earlier, the constitutional rights that every re resident in the region deserves, right? Experts. Are they going to get the similar or better education, right? Are they going to get the similar or better healthcare, perhaps, right? Are they going to get the better infrastructure? So I think, again, we don't want, again, this is my personal viewpoint here in the, and with due respect to your positions, I guess, on the plebiscite, but that is conditional to so many things that are beyond our control. Then someone like me looks into things from the lens of, let me look at what is achievable for me, right? What is pragmatic here? You know, there's a difference in being practical about certain things and being pragmatic about it. For me, holding the Indian government accountable to show that every kid in the region lives, an, lives a normal life, right? And not lives a life where you can they can say that, well, we grew up in a war zone. Like I know you mentioned that once to our conversation, right? So that is something that we can hold accountable and we must hold accountable, I guess, as progressive voices. Uh, and uh, so I think that's, and I, to me, that is achievable also to a large degree, whether it's BJP in power today, whether it's Congress in power tomorrow or whoever comes in power, that is something that I think that we as a civil society can force the government to look into that th those aspects of the uh, post the Article 370 abrogation, uh, in my view. Well, fingers crossed on that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I had expected the session to end probably an hour ago, but we have we have the audience still the end, which is commendable, which is amazing. Um, we have addressed a lot of questions, guys. Um, in case you have any more questions, you're most welcome to uh, send them on the email ID, which uh, the IAP group has actually shared there. Um, if we keep on talking about this thing, it is literally an unending uh, tale, which which can which can go on and on. Uh, it's been an amazing session. Thank you so much, Muzamil. Thank you so much, Manish. It was amazingly insightful, um, and uh, we hope that we can we can still think positive, uh, be positive about it, and we pray that uh, you know the the empathy doesn't die. Um, in India and in other parts of the globe and uh, we somewhere get the acknowledgement that yes what is wrong is wrong and what is right is right so thank you so Absolutely. much guys uh, it was lovely to have you all and uh, thank you so much to the audience because I think 96% of the people are still here till the end which which makes it a success for sure have a lovely evening have a lovely afternoon everybody take care good night thank you good night bye bye Good night. Thank you, guys. Bye.